This is Chapter 1, Part 1 of A Voyage Round the World in His Majesty's Frigate Pandora. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is recorded by Roy Schreiber of George Hamilton's A Voyage Round the World in His Majesty's Frigate Pandora, Chapter 1, Part 1. Government, having resolved to bring to punishment the mutineers of His Majesty's late ship Bounty, and to survey the Straits of Endeavour, to facilitate a passage to Botany Bay, on the 10th of August, 1790, appointed Captain Edward Edwards to put in commission at Chatham, and to take command of the Pandora frigate of twenty-four guns and a hundred and sixty men. A great naval armament, then equipping, retarded our progress, and prevented that particular attention to the choice of men which their lordships so much wished. As contagion here crept amongst us from infected clothing, the fatal effects of which we discovered and severely experienced in the commencement of the voyage. Everything necessary being completed, and an additional complement of naval stores received for the refitment of the bounty, dropped down to Sheerness, saluted Admiral Dalrymple, paid the same compliments to Sir Richard King in passing the Downs, arrived at Portsmouth, and found there Lord Howe with the Union flag at the main, and the proudest navy that ever graced the British seas under his command. Here the officers and men received six months' pay in advance, and after receiving their final orders, got the timekeeper on board, weighed anchor, and proceeded to sea. As the white cliffs of Albion receded from our view, alternate hopes and fears took possession of our minds, wafting the last kind adieu to our native soil. We pursued our voyage with a favorable breeze, but the Pandora now seemed inclined to shed her baneful influence amongst us, and a malignant fever threatened much havoc, as in a few days thirty-five men were confined to their beds, and unfortunately Mr. Innes, the surgeon's only mate, was among the first taken ill. What rendered our situation still more distressing was the crowded state of the ship being filled to the hatchways with stores and provisions, for, like weevils, we had to eat a hole in our bread before we had a place to lay down in, every officer's cabin, the captain's not excepted, being filled with provisions and stores. Our sufferings were much more increased for want of room to accommodate our sick, notwithstanding every effort of the captain that humanity could suggest. In this sickly lumbered state, near the latitude of Madeira, we observed a sail bearing down upon us. From her appearance and manoeuvres, we had every reason to believe she was a ship of war, and a rumour of a Spanish war prevailing when we left England rendered it necessary to clear the ship for action. As soon as our guns were run out, and all hands at quarters got alongside of her, when she proved His Majesty's ship Shark, sent out with orders to recall Admiral Cornish, who had sailed for the West Indies a few days before we left Spithead. This little disaster deranged us much, having at the same time bad weather attended with heavy thundersqualls. The peak of Tenerife now began to show his venerable crest, towering above the clouds, and in two days more came to an anchor in the road of Santa Cruz, but did not salute, as the commandant had not authority to return it. Immediately on our arrival we were boarded by the postmaster, by whom we learnt they had been in much apprehension of a disagreeable visit from the English, and were happy to hear that matters were amicably settled between the courts of Madrid and St. James's. With respect to sight, nothing can be more beautifully picturesque than the town of Santa Cruz. It stands in the center of a spacious bay, on a gentle acclivity, surrounded by retiring hills, and the noble promontory of the peak, 
rising majestically behind it, dignifies the scene beyond description, being continually diversified with every vicissitude of the surrounding atmosphere, emerging and retiring through the fleecy clouds from the bottom of the mountain to its summit. All of the circumjacent hills on the margin of the beach are tufted with little forts and barbette batteries, forming an esplanade round the bay, affording a most agreeable landscape, the houses being all painted white, pretty regularly built, and standing on a rising ground, rises one street above another, and heightens the scene from the water, to which the governor's garden contributes much to beautify the town. In the center of the principal square is a well-built fountain, continually playing, which in a warm climate has a desirable cooling effect. There is but one church, which contains a few indifferent paintings. The inhabitants are civil, but reserved, and the Inquisition, being on the island, spreads a gloomy distrust on the countenance of the people. The troops are miserably clothed, and poverty and superstition lord it wide. The wines of this place, from the late improvement in the vines, are equal to the second kind of Madeira, and I cannot pass over this subject without much honourable mention of the candour of Mr. Rooney, our wine merchant. Here we completed our water from an aqueduct admirably constructed for the convenience of shipping, and after receiving on board lemons, oranges, pomegranates, and bananas, and every variety of fruits and other refreshments with which this island most plentifully abounds, proceeded again on our voyage. The fever that prevailed on our leaving England came now pretty general, and almost every man had it in turn, and as we approached the line many of the convalescents had a relapse, but the lords of the admiralty, previous to our sailing, had supplied us with such unbounded liberality in everything necessary for the preservation of seamen's health, that I may venture to say many lives were saved from their bounty, and I should be wanting to my duty to their lordships, as well as the community, was I to pass over in silence the uncommon good effects we experienced from supplying the sick and convalescent with tea and sugar, this being the first time it was ever introduced into His Majesty's service, but it is an article in life that has crept in such, such universal use in all orders of society that it needs no comment of mine to recommend it. It may, however, be easily conceived that it will be sought with much avidity by those whose element consists chiefly of animal food, and that always salt, and often of the worst kind. Their bread, too, is generally mixed with oatmeal, and of a hot, drying nature. Scarcity of water is a calamity to which seafaring people are always subject and it is an established fact that a pint of tea will satiate thirst more than a quart of water. But when sickness takes place, a loathing of all animal food follows. Then tea becomes their sole existence, and that which can be conveyed to them as natural food will be taken with pleasure, when any slip-slop given as drink will be rejected with disgust. Suffice it to say, that quartermasters and real good seamen have ever observed to be regular in cooking their little pot of tea or coffee, and in America seamen going on long voyages always make it an article in their agreement to be supplied with tea and sugar. The air now becoming intolerably hot, and to evacuate the foul air from below where the people slept, had recourse to Mr. White's new ventilator, but found little benefit from it. Not from any fault of the machine, but from the crowded state of the ship it was impossible to throw a current of air into those spaces where it was most wanted. And by the addition of a flexible leather tube, like a water engine, 
it might be rendered of utmost importance to the service, as in tenders press holes, and in line of battle ships at sea, when the lower deck ports cannot be opened. Where often the jail fever and all the calamities that attend human nature in crowded situations are engendered, that might be entirely obviated by Mr. White's ingenious machine. I should beg to recommend wheels to be substituted for legs to it, for its easier conveyance from one part of the ship to another, and that he would sacrifice beauty to strength, as a slight mahogany gym crack is not well calculated to the severity of heat we were exposed to in climates where it is most wanted. There were now many water-spouts about the ship at which we fired several guns. The thermometer fluctuated between seventy-nine and eighty, and without anything worthy of remark in the common occurrences of things at sea, on the twenty-eighth of December saw the land of the Brazils, and in two days saluted the fort at Rio de Janeiro with fifteen guns, which was immediately returned. On our coming to anchor, an officer came to acquaint the captain that a party of soldiers should be sent on board of us, agreeable to their custom, which was peremptorily denied as inadmissible with the dignity of the British flag, nor would Captain Edwards go on shore to pay his respects to the viceroy, till that etiquette was settled that his boat should not be boarded. After the usual compliments were paid the viceroy, his suit of carriages were ordered to attend the British officers, and Monsieur Lafont, the surgeon-general, who spoke English with ease and fluency, showed us every mark of politeness and attention on the occasion, in carrying us through the principal streets, then visited the public gardens, built by the late viceroy, and laid out with much taste and expense. All the extremity of the garden is a fine terrace which commands a view of the water, and is frequented by people of fashion as their grand mall. At each end of the terrace there is an octagonal room built, superbly furnished, where merandas are sometimes given. On the panels are painted the various productions and commerce of South America, representing the diamond fishery, the process of indigo trade, the rice grounds and harvest, sugar plantations, South Sea whale fishery, and etc. These are interspersed with views of the country, and the quadrupeds that inhabit those parts. The ceiling contained all variety, the one of fish, the other of fowl of that continent. The compartments of the ceiling of the one room were enriched with shell work, with all the variegated shells of that country, and in the compartments are delineated all the variety of fish that the coast of South America produces. The other compartment is enriched with feathers, so inimitably blended as to produce the happiest effect. In this ceiling is painted all birds and fowls of the country, in all their splendid elegance of plumage. The sofas and furniture are rich in the extreme, and in this elegant recess an idle traveller may have an agreeable lounge, and at one view comprehend the whole natural history of this vast continent. In the centre of the terrace there is a jet of water, in the form of a large palm-tree, made of copper, which at pleasure may be made to spout water from the extremity of all the leaves. This tree stands on a well-disposed grotto, which rises from the gravel walk below the level of the terrace, and terminates the view of the principal walk. Near the foot of the grotto, two large alligators, made of copper, are continually discharging water into a handsome basin of white marble filled with gold and silver fishes. There are fine orangeries and lofty covered arbors in different parts of the garden, capable of containing a thousand people. Here the Cyprian nymphs hold their nocturnal revels, but intrigue is in attended with great danger, as the stiletto 
is in general use, and assassination frequent, the men being of a jealous sanguinary turn, and the women fond of gallantry, who never appear in public unveiled. When Bougainville, the French circumnavigator, called here, his chaplain was assassinated in a fray of that kind. But since that accident, orders were given that a commissioned officer should attend all foreign officers, and a soldier the privates, and all strangers on landing are conducted to the main guard for their escort. This answers a double purpose, as they are much afraid of strangers smuggling or carrying money out of the country. Under the mask of personal protection, every motion is watched and scrutinized, nor can you purchase anything of a merchant till he has settled with the officer of police how much he shall exact for his goods. So you have always the satisfaction of being robbed as the act directs. The trade of this country is much cramped by the improper policy of the mother country, for although it abounds in everything that the earth produces, wealth is far from being diffusive and a spirit of revolt seems to prevail amongst them. But they are rather premature here in the business, a conspiracy being detected whilst we were there, many of the first people in the country thrown into dungeons, and a strong guard put over them, and all intercourse denied them. In order to check that spirit of rebellion among the colonists, a regiment of black slaves is now embodied who will be very ready to bear arms against their oppressive masters. But should a revolution in South America take place, which sooner or later must eventually happen, some of our South Sea discoveries would then prove an advantageous situation for a little British colony. All public works are done here by slaves in chains, who perform a kind of plaintive melancholy dirge in recitative, to soothe their unavailing toil, which, with the accompaniment of the clanking of their irons, is the real voice of woe, and attunes the soul to sympathy and compassion more than the most elaborate piece of music. The troops are remarkably well clothed and in fine order, both infantry and cavalry. Their horses are small, but spirited, and tournaments frequently performed as the favorite amusement of the inhabitants at which the cavaliers display a wonderful share of address. The town is large, built of stone, and the streets very regular. There are several handsome churches, monasteries, and nunneries, and contains about forty thousand inhabitants. But like the old town of Edinburgh, each floor contains a distinct family, and of course liable to some inconveniences, cleanliness being none of its most shining virtues. The officers of the army showed us uncommon kindness, and made us some presents of red bird skins for the savages we were going amongst. I cannot in words bestow sufficient panjaric on the laudable exertions of my worthy messmates, Lieutenants Corner and Hayward, for their unremitting zeal in procuring and nurturing such plants as might be useful at Otaheite or the islands we might discover. We now took leave of our friends here, and it was with some regret, as it was bidding adieu to civilized life for a very indeterminate space of time. Lieutenant Hayward, having finished his astronomical observations on shore, came on board with the timekeeper and instruments, and again proceeded on our voyage on the morning of January 8, 1791. In running down the coast of the Brazils, saw several spermaceti whales and vessels employed in that fishery. Could it have been accomplished in the month of January, it was intended to make in supply of water at New Year's Harbor. But the season was too far advanced. The weather now became cold, and the health of the people mended apace. 
passed the Straits of Magellan, and on the 31st of January saw Cape San Juan, Staten Island, and New Year's Island. The thermometer was at 48 degrees. We were fortunate enough to weather the tempestuous regions of Cape Horn without anything remarkable happening, although late in the season. The weather, as we advanced, became now exceedingly pleasant, and many good things with which we were supplied began to have a wonderful good effect on the strength of our convalescence. I beg here the reader's indulgence for a small digression on the health of the seamen, as it is a subject of much national importance, and those voyages, the only test of what is found to succeed best, my duty leads me to attempt, however unequal, to the task. It may be remarked, the sauerkraut kept during the voyage in the highest perfection, and was often eaten as a salad with vinegar, in preference to recent cut vegetables from shore. A cast of this grand antiscorbutic was kept open for the crew to eat as much as they pleased, and I will venture to affirm that it will answer every purpose that can be expected from the vegetable kingdom. The essence of malt afforded a most delightful beverage, and, with the addition of a little hops, in the warmest climates, made as good strong beer as we could in England. We were likewise supplied with malt and grain, but should prefer the essence, as it is liable to decay, and stows in much less room, which is a very valuable consideration in long voyages. Cocoa we found great benefits from. It is much relished by the men, stows in little room, and affords great nourishment. At the close of the war in 1783 in the West Indies, men that had been the whole war on salt provisions from a liberal use of cocoa got fat and strong, and in the Agamemnon we found we had five hundred men who served most of the war on salt provisions, but after the cocoa was introduced, we had not a sick man on board till the day she was paid off. Indeed, it was the only article of nourishment in sea victualling, for what can in reason be expected from beef or pork after it has been salted a year or two? Wheat we found answer extremely well, rough ground, in a mill, occasionally as we wanted it, and, with the addition of a little brown sugar, it made a pleasant nourishing diet, of which the men were extremely fond. Another great advantage attending it, that it does not require half the quantity of water that peas do. Soft bread was found extremely beneficial to the sick and convalescent, and we availed ourselves of every opportunity of baking for half the complement at a time. As the flour keeps so much longer sound than biscuit, it may be needless to remark its superior advantages. Besides, it is not liable to be damaged by water or otherwise, so much as bread, as a crust forms outside, which protects the rest. In point of stowage, it is likewise preferable. As the fate of every expedition of this kind depends on the exertion of the subordinate departments of office, the thanks of every individual in the Pandora is due to Mr. Cherry for his uncommon attention to vittling. The dividing the people into three watchers had a double good effect, as it gave them longer time to sleep and dry themselves before they turned in. And as most of our crew consisted of landsmen, a fewer people being on deck at a time rendered it necessary to exert themselves more in learning their duty. The air now became temperate, mild, and agreeable, but unfortunately we sprung a leak in the after part of the ship, which reached the bread-room, and damaged much of it, as one thousand five hundred and fifteen pounds were thrown overboard, and a great deal much injured that we kept for the feeding of the cattle. Many blue petrels were seen flying about, and on the 4th of March 
saw Easter Island. We now set the forge to work, and the armorers were busily employed in making knives and ironwork to trade with the savages. On the 16th we discovered a lagoon island of about three or four miles extant. It was well wooded, but had no inhabitants, and was named Ducey's Island in honor of Lord Ducey. On the 17th we discovered another island, about five or six miles long, with a great many trees on it, but was not inhabited, and this was called Lord Hood's Island. On the 19th we discovered an island of the same description as the former, which was named Carisford's Island in honor of Lord Carisford. On the 22nd we passed Maitia, and on the morning of the 23rd of March anchored in Maitivi Bay in the island of Otaheite. In the dawn of morning a native immediately on seeing us paddled off in his canoe, and came on board, who showed expressions of joy to a degree of madness on embracing and saluting us, by whom we learnt that several of the mutineers were on the island, but that Mr. Christian and nine men had left Otaheite long since on the bounty, and amused the natives by telling them Captain Bly had gone to settle Waitutaki, and that Captain Cook was living there language cannot express his surprise on Lieutenant Hayward being introduced to him, who had purposely been concealed. At eleven in the forenoon, the launch and the pinnace was dispatched with Lieutenants Corner and Hayward, and twenty-six men, to the northwest part of the island, in quest of the mutineers. Immediately on our arrival, Joseph Coleman, the armorer of the bounty, came on board, and a little after the two midshipmen belonging to the bounty. At three, Richard Skinner came off, and on the twenty-fifth the boats returned, after chasing the mutineers on shore, and taking possession of their boat. As they had taken to the heights, and claimed the protection of Temarara, a great chief of Peapara, who was the proper king of Otaheite, the present family of Otu being usurpers, and who intended, had we not arrived with the assistance of the bounty people, to have disputed the point with Otu. On the 27th we sent the penance with a present of a bottle of rum to King Otu, who was with his two queens at Taya Arobu, requesting the honor of his company. But the bottle of rum removed all scruples, and the next day the royal family paid us a visit. In his suite came Odidi, a chief particularly noted by Captain Cook. On the first visit they made it a point of honor of accepting no present, but they made sufficient amends for that by introducing a numerous train of dependents afterwards to obtain presents. The king, a tall, handsome-looking man about six foot three inches high, good-natured, and affable in his manners. His principal queen, Idea, is a robust-looking, coarse woman about thirty, and was extremely solicitous in learning and adopting our customs, and on hearing our English ladies drank tea, became very fond of it. The other queen, or concubine, Aridi, is a pretty young creature, about sixteen years of age. They all sleep, three sleep together, and live in the most perfect harmony. A detachment of men were immediately ordered, under the command of Lieutenant Corner, to march across the country, and, if possible, to get between the mountains and the mutineers. This gentleman was extremely well calculated for an expedition of this kind, having, in the earlier part of his life, bore a commission in the land service, and the next morning they landed at Point Venus, attended by the principal chiefs as conductors and a number of common people to assist in carrying ammunition over the heights. What rendered their assistance more necessary was their having to cross a rapid cataract or river, which came down from the mountains, and formed so many curves. They had to ford it sixteen times in the course of their journey, which gave evident proofs of the superior strength 
of the natives over the English seamen. The former went over with ease, where the sailors could not stand the rapidity of the torrent without their help. They were, however, forced to send to the ship for ropes and tackle, to gain some heights which were otherwise inaccessible. On the party coming to rest, the lieutenant expressed a wish to one of the natives for something to eat, who told him that he might be supplied with plenty of victuals, ready dressed. He immediately ran to a temple, or place of worship, where meat was regularly served to their god, and came running with a roasted pig that had been presented that day. This striking instance of impiety rather startled the lieutenant, which the other easily got over by saying there was more left than the god could eat. It was with much difficulty they could restrain the natives from committing deprivations on the kava grounds of the upper districts, as they were on the eve of a war with them respecting the hereditary right of the crown. The party now arrived at the residence of, of the great chief, who received them with much hospitality and kindness, and after refreshing them with plenty of meat and drink, carried the officer to visit the moray of the dead chief, his father. Mr. Corner, judging it necessary, by every mark of attention, to gain the good graces of this great man, ordered his party to draw up and fire three volleys over the deceased, who was brought out in his best clothes on the occasion. But the burning cartridge from one of the muskets unfortunately set fire to the paper clothes of the dead chief. This unlucky disaster threw the sun into the greatest perplexity, as agreeable to their laws, should the corpse of his father be stolen away or otherwise destroyed, he forfeits his title and estate, and it descends to the next heir. The end of chapter one, part one, of the voyage round the world of His Majesty's frigate Pandora, by George Hamilton. Part Two of A Voyage Round the World in His Majesty's Frigate Pandora. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is recorded here by Roy Schreiber. Chapter One, Part Two. There was at the same time a party embarked by water under the command of Lieutenant Hayward, who took with him some of the principal chiefs, amongst whom was Odidi before mentioned by Captain Cook, who went on a voyage with him, but fell into disrepute amongst them, from affirming he had seen water in a solid form, alluding to ice. He also took with him one brown, an Englishman, that had been left on shore by an American vessel that had called here for being troublesome on board, but otherwise a keen, penetrating, active fellow, who rendered many eminent services both in this expedition and in the subsequent part of the voyage. He had lived upwards of twelve months amongst the natives, adapted perfectly their manners and customs, even to eating of raw fish, and dipping his roast pork into a coconut shell of salt water, according to their manner, as a substitute for salt. He likewise avoided all intercourse and communication with bounty people, by which means necessity forced him to gain a pretty competent knowledge of their language, and from a natural complexion that was much darker than any of the natives. Captain Edwards had taken every possible means of gaming the friendship of Temerara, the great prince of the upper district by sending him very liberal presents, which effectually bought him to our interest. The mutineers were now cut off from every hope of recourse. The natives were harassing them from behind, and Mr. Hayward and his party advancing in front, under cover of night, they had taken shelter in a hut in the woods, but were discovered by Brown, who, creeping up to the place where they were asleep, distinguished them from the natives by feeling their toes, 
as people unaccustomed to wear shoes are easily discovered from the spread of their toes. The next day Mr. Hayward attacked them, but they grounded their arms without opposition. Their hands were bound behind their back and sent down to the boat under a strong guard. During the whole business there was only two natives killed, one was shot in the dusk of the evening, two nights before the people surrendered, by one of the sentinels, who had his musket twice beaten out of his hands, from the natives pelting our party with large stones. But the instant he was shot, some of his friends rushed in and carried off the corpse. The other native was shot by the mutineers. When attacked by the natives, they took to a river, a stone being thrown by one of the natives at the wife or woman of one of the mutineers, enraged him so much that he immediately shot the offender. A prison was built for their accommodation on the quarter-deck, that they might be secure and apart from the ship's company, and that it might have every advantage of a free circulation of air, which rendered it the most desirable place on the ship. Orders were likewise given that they should be victualled in every respect, in the same as the ship's company, both meat and liquor, and all the extra indulgences with which we were so liberally supplied, notwithstanding the established laws of the service, which restricts prisoners to two-thirds allowance. But Captain Edwards, very humanely commiserated with their unhappy and inevitable length of confinement, Orope, the king's brother, a discerning, sensible, and intelligent chief, discovered a conspiracy amongst the natives on shore to cut our cables should it come to blow hard from the sea. This was more to be dreaded, as many of the prisoners were married to the most respectable chief's daughters in the district opposite to where we lay at anchor, in particular one, who took the name of Stuart, a man of great possessions in landed property, near Matavivi Bay, a gentleman of that name belonging to the bounty, having married his daughter, and he, as friend and father-in-law, agreeable to their custom, took his name. O to the king, his two brothers, and all the principal chiefs, appeared extremely anxious for our safety, and after the prisoners were on board, kept watch during the night were always keeping a sharp lookout upon our cables and continually spurring the sentinels to be careful in their duty. The prisoners' wives visited the ship daily and brought their children, who were permitted to be carried to their unhappy fathers, to see poor captives in irons weeping over their tender offspring was too moving a scene for any feeling heart. Their wives brought them ample supplies of every delicacy that the country afforded while we lay there and behaved with the greatest fidelity and affection to them. The next day the king, his two queens, and retinue came on board to pay us a formal visit, preceded by a band of music. The ladies had about sixty or seventy yards of Otaheite cloth wrapped around them, and were so bulky and unwieldy with it that we were obliged to hoist them aboard like horned cattle. Hogs, coconuts, bananas a rich sort of peach, and a variety of ready-dressed puddings and victuals composed their present to the captain. As soon as they were on board, the captain disencumbered the ladies by rolling their linen around his middle, an indispensable ceremony here in receiving a present of cloth, and Madua, wife of Ori Pai, the king's brother, took a great liking to the captain's laced coat, which he immediately put on her with much gallantry and that beautiful princess seemed much elated with her new finery. I cannot omit a circumstance of this lady's attachment to dress. There was a custom which had prevailed for a long time to present the god with all red feathers that be, could be procured, but thinking she would become red feathers full as well as his godship, immediately employed all her domestics making them up into fly-flaps and personal adornments, to prevent the altar making a monopoly of the good things in this as well as other countries. A grand hieva was next day ordered for our entertainment ashore on Point Venus, 
and on our landing we were preceded by a band of music, and led to where the king and his levy were in waiting to receive us. The course was soon cleared by the chiefs, and the entertainment began by two men, who vied with each other in filthy and lascivious attitudes, and frightful distortions of their mouths. These having performed their part, two ladies, pretty fancifully dressed, as described in Captain Cook's voyages, were introduced after a little ceremony. Something resembling a turkey cock's tail, stuck on their rumps in a fan kind of fashion, about five feet in diameter, had a good effect while the ladies kept their faces to us. But when, in a bending attitude, they presented their rumps to show the wonderful agility of their loins, the effect is better conceived than described. After half an hour's hard exercise, the dear creatures had roused themselves to a perfect furor, and the piece concluded by the ladies exposing that which is better felt than seen, and in that state of nature walked from the bottom of the theatre to the top where we were sitting on the grass, till they approached just by us, and when we complimented them in bowing with all the honours of war. These accomplishments are so much prized amongst them that girls come from the interior part of the country to the court residence for improvement in the Hieva, just as country gentlemen send their daughters to London boarding schools. This may well be called the Cerithia of the Southern Hemisphere, not only the beauty and elegance of the women, but their being so deeply versed in and so passionately fond of the Eleusian mysteries, and what poetic fiction has painted of Eden or Arcadia is here realized, where the earth without tillage produces both food and clothing, the trees loaded with the richest fruit, the carpet of nature spread with the most odoriferous flowers, and the fair ones ever willing to fill your arms with love. It affords a happy instance of contradicting an opinion propagated by philosophers of a less bountiful soil, who maintain that every virtuous or charitable act a man commits is for selfish or interested views. Here human nature appears in more amiable colors, and the soul of man, free from the gripping hand of want, acts with a liberality and bounty that does honor to his God. A native of this country divides everything in common with his friends, and the extent of the word friend by them is only bounded by the universe. And was he reduced to his last morsel of bread? He cheerfully halves it with him, the next that comes has the same claim, if he wants it, and so in succession to the last mouthful he has. Rank makes no difference in hospitality, for the king and the beggar relieve each other in common. The English are allowed by the rest of the world, and I believe with some degree of justice, to be a generous, charitable people but the Otahitians could not help bestowing the most contemptuous word in their language upon us, which is piri-piri, or stingy. In becoming the tio, or friend of a man, it is expected you pay him a compliment by cherishing his wife. But, being ignorant of that ceremony, I very innocently gave high offence to Maitura Ora, the king of York Island, to whom I was introduced as his friend, a shyness took place on the side of his majesty, from my neglect of his wife, but through the medium of Brown the interpreter he put me in mind of my duty, and on my promising my endeavours matters were for that time made up. It was, to me, however, a very serious inauguration. I was in the first place not a young man and had been on shore a whole week, 
The lady was a woman of rank, being the sister to Otu, the king of Otaheite, and had in her youth been beautiful, and named Peggy Otu. She is the right-hand dancing figure so elegantly delineated in Cook's voyages. But Peggy had seen much service, and bore away many honourable scars in the field of Venus. However, his majesty's service must be done, and Matoura and I were again friends. He was a domesticated man, and passionately fond of his wife and children, but now became pensive and melancholy, dreading the child should be piebald, though the lady was six months advanced in pregnancy before we came to the island. The force of friendship amongst those good creatures will be more fully understood from the following circumstance. Churchill, the principal ling ringleader of the mutineers on his landing, became the Tio or friend of a great chief in the upper district. Some time after the chief happening to die without issue, his title and estate agreeable to the law of Tio ship devolved on Churchill, who, having some dispute with one Thompson of the Bounty, was shot by him. The natives immediately rose and revenged the death of Churchill, their chief, by killing Thompson, whose skull was afterwards shown us, and which bore evident marks of fracture. Odidi, although perfectly devoted to our interest, on being appointed one of the guides in the expedition against the mutineers, expressed great horror at the act he was going to commit in betraying his friend, being Tio, one of them. There was much less addiction to thieving than when Captain Cook visited them, and when things were stolen, by applying to the magistrate of the district, the goods were immediately returned, for like every other well-regulated police, the thief and the justice were one gang. Sometimes we slightly punished the offenders by cutting off their hair, a beautiful young creature, who lived at the observatory with one of our young gentlemen, slipped out of bed from him one night, and stole all his linen. She was punished for the theft by shaving one of her eyebrows and half the hair off her head. She immediately run into the woods, and used to come once or twice a day to the tent to request looking at herself in the glass, but the grotesque figure she cut, with one side entirely bald, made her shriek out, and run into the woods to shun society. With respect to agriculture, in a soil where nature has done so much, little is left to human industry. But had there been occasion of it, abilities would not be wanting. It is much to be lamented that the endeavors of the philanthropic Sir Joseph Banks were frustrated by the raising of everything which he took so much pains to rear amongst them a few shaddocks excepted. Tobacco and cotton have escaped their ravage, and they are much mortified that they cannot eradicate it from their grounds. But were a hand-loom on a simple construction, as used by the natives of Java, introduced amongst them, they could soon turn their cotton to good account. An instance of their ingenuity and imitative power in matting was a thing perfectly unknown amongst them till Captain Cook introduced it from Anamooka, one of the friendly isles. But in that branch of manufacture they now far surpass the original. They have likewise abundance of fine sugar canes growing spontaneously all over the island, from which rum and sugar might be extracted. Indeed, an attempt was made by Coleman, the armorer of the bounty, who made a still, and succeeded but dreading the effects of intoxication most among, both amongst themselves and the natives, very wisely put an end to his labors by breaking the still. Captain Bly has likewise planted Indian corn, from which much may be expected. On our landing, as soon as public business of more importance would permit, our gentlemen were indefatigable in laying out a piece of garden ground and ditching it round lemons, oranges, limes, pineapples, plants of the coffee tree, with all the lesser class of things as onions, lettuces, peas, cabbage, and everything necessary for culinary purposes were planted. 
in order that they might not meet the same fate of the things planted by Sir Joseph Banks, Captain Edwards made use of every stratagem to make the chiefs fond of the oranges and limes, by dipping them in sugar, to cover the acid before it was presented to them to eat. Messrs. Corning and Hayward were equally zealous in using the most persuasive arguments with the chiefs to take care of our garden, and rear and propagate the plants when we were gone, to all of which they lent a deaf ear, and treated the subject with much levity, saying that they might be very good to us, but that they were already plentifully supplied with everything wished or wanted, and had not occasion for more. But the lieutenants, representing that, if on our return they should supply us with plenty of such articles as we left with them, they might exchange them for hatchets, knives, and red cloth, they seem more favorably inclined to our project, and I had no doubt that some after-navigators will reap the benefit of their industry. The breadfruit, although the most delicate and nourishing of food upon earth, is, with people like them, liable to inconveniences for in such a group or archipelago of islands, whose inhabitants are in various gradations of refinement, from the gentle and polished Otahitian to the savage and cannibal Fiji, a war amongst them is often attended with devastation as well as famine. By cutting round the bark of the breadfruit tree, a whole country may be laid to waste for four or five years, young trees not bearing in less time. Crops, such as Indian corn, English wheat, and peas, that have been left amongst them, can in time of war be stored in granaries on the top of their almost inaccessible mountains. While speaking of the breadfruit tree, I cannot exemplify my subject from what happened to an island contiguous to Tahiti, whose coast abounded with fine fish, and the Otahitians being themselves too lazy to catch them, destroyed all the breadfruit trees on this little island, by which act of policy they were obliged to send over boats with fish regularly to market to be supplied with bread in barter from Otaheite. To this island they likewise send their wives, thinking they become fair by living on fish and low diet. They also send boys for the same reason whom they keep for abominable purposes. As to religion of this country, it is difficult for me to define it. Their tenets, although equally ignorant of heathen mythology or theological intricacies, seem to partake of both, and like other nations in early stages of society are rendered subservient to political purposes as by the machinery of deification person of the king is sacred and inviolable. Notwithstanding the king to be a broad-shouldered strapping fellow, three sturdy stallions or lords-in-waiting are kept for the particular amusement of the queen when his majesty is in his cups. Yet the royal issue is always declared to be sprung from the immortal gods, and their heir apparent during his minority, is put under the tuition of the high priest. Their god is supposed to be omnipresent, and is worshipped in spirit, idolatry not being known amongst them. The sacred mysteries are only known to the priests and augurs, the king, princes, and great chiefs, the common people only serving as victims or to fill up the pageantry of the religious procession. One of our gentlemen, expressing a wish to the high priest of carrying from amongst them that god whose altars craved so much human blood, he, like a true priest, had his subterfuge ready, by saying there were more of the same family in other islands from whence they could easily be supplied. On all great occasions, each district sends a male victim and the island containing forty districts, it may be presumed the mortality is great. Between the sacrifices and the ravages of war, 
a preponderating number of females must have taken place, to counteract which a law passed that every other female child should be put to death at birth, and the husband, always officiating as au cachet to his wife, the child is destroyed as soon as the sex discovered. The absurdity of this inhuman law is now pretty evident. Women are become more scarce, and set a higher value on their charms, which occasions many desperate battles amongst them. Some with fractured skulls are sent on board of us, which had been got in amorous affrays of that kind. It may be naturally supposed that people of such gentle natures make no conspicuous figure in the theatre of war. Their war canoes are very large, on which a platform is placed capable of containing from a hundred and fifty to two hundred men, but their taste in decorating the prow of their men of war plainly indicates that they are more versed in the fields of Venus than Mars. Every man of war having a figurehead of the god Priapus, with a preposterous insignia of his order, the sight of which never fails to excite great glee and good humor amongst the ladies. It is customary with those nations at war that the treaty of peace be confirmed by the conquerors sending a certain number of their women to cohabit with the nation that is vanquished, in order to conciliate their affection by a bond more lasting than wax and parchment. It was the unhappy lot of Otaheite to be overcome by a nation whose women were too masculine for them, they being accustomed to the amorous dalliance of their own beautiful females, were averse to familiar intercourse with strangers. The ladies returned with all the rage of disappointed women, and the war was renewed in all its horrors. They were well acquainted with the bow and arrow, but use it as an amusement. The only missive weapons they use are the sling and the spear. They have now amongst them about twenty stand of arms, and two hundred rounds of powder and ball. They can take a musket to pieces, and put it up again. Our good marksmen take proper care of their arms and ammunition, and are highly sensible of the superior advantage it gives them over the neighboring nations. In preparing and printing their cloth, the women display a great share of ingenuity and good taste. Many of their figures were exactly patterns which prevailed as fashionable when we left England, both striped and figured. They print their figured cloth by dipping the leaves in dye stuffs of different colors, and placing them as their fancy directs. Their cloth is of a different texture of fineness, from the stuff of the same nature in quality as the slightest Indian paper, to a kind as durable as some of our cottons, but they will not bear water, and of course become troublesome and expensive. They are generally made up in bales, running about two yards broad and twenty or thirty yards long. We had some thousands of yards of it sent on board as presents. Their sumptuary laws, at first sight, may appear severe toward the fair sex, who are not permitted to eat butcher meat, nor to eat at all in the presence of their husbands. It certainly does not convey the most delicate ideas to a mind impressed with much sensibility to see a fine woman devouring a piece of beef and those voluptuaries who may be said to exist only by their women would naturally endeavor to remove the possibility of priests supposing a disgusting idea in that object in which their happiness centers. Every woman, the queen and the royal family excepted, on the approach of the king, is denuded down to the waist, and continues so whilst his majesty is in sight. Should the king enter a woman's house, it is immediately pulled down. The king is never permitted to help himself with meat or drink, which makes him a very troublesome visitor, as he is never quiet while a bottle is in sight till he has had the last drop of it. Their houses are well adapted to temperate climate they inhabit, and generally consist of three chambers, the interior one of which the chief retires to, 
after he has drunk his kava. A profound silence is observed during his repose, for should they be suddenly awakened, it produces violent vomiting and a train of uneasy sensations. Otherwise, if undisturbed, it proves a safe anodyne, creates amorous dreams and a powerful excitement to venery. In the adjoining chamber, his fair sp spouse awaits, with eager expectation to avail herself of the happy moment when her lord should awake, which is by slow degrees, and he is roused from Elysium by her gentle offices, in tenderly embracing every part of his body, until his ideal scenes of bliss are realized. And when fully sated with this luscious banquet, they retire to the bath, to gather fresh vigor for renewal of similar joys. In this mazy round of chaste dissipation, the hours glide on, and the evening is spent in dancing to the music of Pan's pipe, the flute, and the hieva drum. They then go to the bath again, and the festivity of the evening is concluded with a repast of fruit and young coconut milk. The whole village indiscriminately join the feast and the demon of rank and precedence, with their appendages, malevolence, and envy, has never yet disturbed their happy board. Happy would it have been for those people had they never been visited by Europeans, for to our shame it be spoken, disease and gunpowder is all the benefit they have ever received from us, in return for their hospitality and kindness. The ravages of venereal disease is evident, from the mutilated objects so frequent amongst them, where death has not drawn a charitable veil over their misery by putting a period to their existence. A disease of the consumptive kind has of late made great havoc amongst them. This they call the British disease, as they have only had it since their intercourse with the English. In this complaint they are avoided by society, from a supposition of its being contagious, and in every old outhouse you will find miserable objects, for want of medical assistance, abandoned to their wretched fate. From what we could learn, it generally terminates fatally in ten or twelve months, but I am led to believe that in many cases it originates from the venereal disease. The voice of humanity, honor, and justice calls upon us as a nation to remedy those evils by sending some intelligent surgeon to live amongst them. They are at present panting for the pruning hand of civilization and the arts. Love and adore us as beings of superior nature, but gently abrade us with having left them in the same abject state they were in when first discovered. We had buoyed many of them with the hopes of carrying them to England with us, in order to secure their fidelity and honesty, especially those who were the most useful in our domestic concerns. But on explaining to them that even bread was not to be obtained in England without labor, they lost hopes of their favorite voyage. Large presents were now brought us for our sea-store, and notwithstanding Mr. Bentham our purser, having most liberally supplied the ship with four pounds of fresh pork per man each day, it made no apparent scarcity. Besides salting some thousand weight and a prodigious number of goats, fowls, and other things, could we have made it convenient to have stayed another week, some cows were promised to have been sent from a neighboring island. Captain Cook had left them a horse, a mare, a cow, a calf, and a bull, but, from some mistake, they killed the horse instead of one of the cows, and found it very tough, disagreeable eating, by which means they were disgusted with all horned cattle, and drew an unfavorable conclusion that their meat was all of the same texture. Had some pains been taken with them to get the better of a dislike they have to milk, and explain to them how variously it might be employed as food, I have no doubt they would have paid more attention to the horned cattle. They used to persist in saying that milk was urine, but on pointing to a woman that was suckling a child, 
and pushing their own argument, they seem convinced of their error. We have left them with a goose and a gander, which they take much delight in. Idea, the queen, endeavoured to conquer that absurd dislike, and at last became fond of milk in her tea. A painting of Captain Cook, done in oil by Weber, which had been delivered to Captain Edwards on his first landing, was now returned to them. It is held by them in the greatest veneration, and I should not be surprised if, one day or other, divine honours should be paid it. They still believe Captain Cook is living, and their seeing Mr. Bentham our purser, whom they perfectly recollect as having been on the voyage with him, and spoke their language, will confirm them in that opinion. The harbour was surveyed by Mr. George Passmore, the master, an able and experienced officer. Our officers here, as at Rio de Janeiro, showed the most manly and philanthropic disposition by giving up their cabins and sacrificing every comfort and convenience for the good of mankind in accommodating boxes with plants of breadfruit trees that the laudable intentions of government might not be frustrated from the loss of his majesty's ship bounty we now completed our water from an excellent spring out of a rock close to the water's edge at Orafe. King Otu, his queen Adia, came on board, and were importunate in their solicitations of Captain Edwards, requesting him to take them to England with him. Aridi the concubine likewise requested the same favour, but she more generously begged that they might all three go together. But Oropai and the other chiefs, remonstrated against his going, as they were on the eve of a war. We were now perfectly ready for sea, and as Captain Cook's picture is presented to all strangers, it is customary for navigators to write their observations on the back of it, and so our arrival and departure were notified upon it. The ship was filled with coconuts and fruit, and as many pigs, goats, and fowls as the decks and the boats could hold. The dismal day of our departure now arrived, and I believe was the first time that an Englishman got up his anchor at the remotest part of the globe with a heavy heart to go home to his own country. Every canoe almost in the island was hovering round the ship, and they began to mourn, as is customary for the death of a near relation. They bared their bodies, cut their heads with shells, smeared their breasts and shoulders with warm blood, as it streamed down, and as the blood ceased flowing, they renewed their wounds in their head, attended with a dismal yell. Otu now took leave of us, and with tears trickling down his cheeks, begged to be remembered to King George. The tender was put in commission, and the command given to Mr. Oliver, the master's mate, Mr. Renard, the midshipman, James Dodds, quartermaster, and six privates were put on board of her. She was decked, beautifully built, and the size of a Gravesend boat. The end of chapter one, part two of A Voyage Round the World by George Hamilton. of George Hamilton's A Voyage Round the World in His Majesty's Frigate Pandora. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Roy Schreiber. George Hamilton's A Voyage Round the World in His Majesty's Frigate Pandora. Chapter 2. With a pleasant breeze on the evening of the 8th of May, we passed Imi'e, or York Island, contiguous to and in sight of Otaheite. It is governed by Matuora, brother-in-law to Otu. It is a pleasant, romantic-looking spot, with very high hills upon it, and about twelve miles in circumference. They are lately attacked by some neighboring power, and Matuora requested the lend of a musket from his friend and ally. When peace was restored, Otu sent for his musket. Matuora represented that, as a man, from a sense of honor, he wished to return it, but as king, 
The love he bore his subjects prevented him from complying with the request. That single musket and a few cartridges gives him no small degree of consequence, and are retained in the royal dower of his wife. Next morning we reached Huha Hini and sent boats on shore in Owara Bay. As Odidi, the chief, requested to go with us to Waitutaki, he went on shore with officers in search for intelligence of the mutineers, but they returned without success. Here we learn the fate of Omai, the native of Otahidi, whom Captain Cook brought from England. On his return here he had wealth enough to obtain every fine woman on the island, and at last fell martyr to Venus, having finished his career by venereal disease two years after his landing. His house and garden are still standing, but his musket occasioned a war after his death, and was found in the possession of a native of Ulaiti. His servant was on board us, but had not retained a single article of his property. On the tenth we examined Ulaiti and Otaha, interchanged presents with the natives, and landed in Shamanin's Bay, but got no information. Next we examined Bula Bula on the eleventh, and Teta, who the king honored us with a visit. The people of this island are of a more warlike disposition than any other of the society islands, an account of that national ferocity of character are much caressed by the Tahitians and neighboring islands. They are sensible of their preeminence, and boast of their country in whatever island you meet them. They are tattooed in a peculiar manner, and whether they may have spread their conquests, or other nations imitated them, I could not learn. But a prodigious number in the islands we afterwards visited were tattooed in their fashion. What was more singular, we saw some of them with their glands penis entirely tattooed, and our men, being tattooed in the arms, legs, and breast, places of much less sensation, were often lame for weeks from the excruciating torture of the operation. Tatahu likewise informed us that there were no white men on Tubay, a small island to the northward of Bula Bula, and under his jurisdiction, nor upon Maruha, another island in sight to the westward of Bula Bula. He also mentioned another island, Mopeha. Here Odidi went on shore, but getting drunk in meeting some of his old friends, he fell asleep and lost his passage. On the twelfth we left Moraha, and on the thirteenth lost sight of the Society Islands. Here one of the prisoners begged to speak with the captain, and gave information of Mr. Christian's intended route. We now shaped our course to fall in to the eastward of Waitutaki, an island discovered by Captain Bly, and on the nineteenth we made the island. We sent the boat on shore, covered by the tender, to examine it, but found it a thing impossible for the bounty to have been there, and the natives said that they had seen no white people. They were very shy, and we could not coax them on board. One of them recollected having seen Lieutenant Hayward on board the bounty. Here we purchased from the natives a spear of the most exquisite workmanship. It was nine feet long, and cut in the form of a Gothic spire all its ornaments being executed in a kind of alto relievo, which, from the slow progress they made with stone tools, must have been the labor of a whole man's life. Here nature begins to assume a ruder aspect, and the silken bands of love gives way to the rustic garniture of war. The natives of either sex wear no clothing, but a girdle of stained leaves around their middle, and the men a gorget of the exact shape and size as at present worn by officers in our service. It is made of the pearl oyster shell. The center is black, and the transparent part of the shell is left as an edge or border to it, which gives it a very fine effect. It is slung round their neck with a band of human hair or the fibers of a coconut shell, of admirable texture, and a rose 
worked at each corner of the gorget, the same as the military great coat of the present day. We now began to discover that the ladies of Otaheite had left us with many warm tokens of their affection. Instructions were given to the commander of the tender to be particular in guarding against surprise, and a rendezvous established in case of separation, and on Sunday, the 22nd of May, made Palmerston's Islands. The tender's signal was made to cover the boats in landing, and some natives were seen rowing across the lagoon at a considerable distance. Soon after their landing, Lieutenant Corner and his party discovered a yard and some spars marked Bounty, and the broad arrow upon them. When this intelligence was communicated to the ship, a signal was made to the party on shore to advance with great circumspection, and to guard against surprise. Mr. Rickards, the master's mate, went in the cutter, and made a circuit of the island. Lieutenants Corner and Haywood landed on different isles with cork jackets, but the surf running very high all round rendered it exceedingly dangerous, and in many places impracticable. Had they not been expert swimmers in duty of this kind, they must have certainly been drowned, as they had not only themselves and the party to take care of, but the arms and ammunition to land dry. About four o'clock in the afternoon, Mr. Saval, the midshipman came on board in the jolly boat, and brought with him several very curious stained canoes, representing the figures of men, fishes, and beasts. He had committed some mistake in the orders he was sent to execute, and was ordered to return immediately to rectify it, but the boat did not come back again. A few minutes after she left the ship, the weather became thick and hazy, and began to blow fresh so that even with the assistance of glasses they could not see whether she made the shore or not. It continued to blow during the night, so as to prevent the party on shore from coming on board. They had been employed during the day in searching all the islands with particular attention, having every reason to suspect that the mutineers were there from finding the bounties, yard, and spars. But at last, wore out with fatigue in marching, and swimming through so many reefs, and having no victuals the whole day, in the evening they began to forage for something to eat. The gigantic cockle was the only thing that presented. Of the shell of one, they made a kettle, to boil some junks of it in it. It may be necessary here to remark, for the information of those who are not acquainted with it, that there are some of them larger than three men can carry. Of this coarse fare, and some coconuts, they made shift, with the assistance of a good appetite, to make a tolerable hearty supper. They then set the watch, and went to sleep. They had thrown a large coconut on the fire before they lay down, and forgot it. But in the middle of the night, the milk of the coconut became so expanded with the heat that it burst with a great explosion. Their minds had been so much engaged in the course of the day with the enterprise they were employed in, expecting muskets to be fired at them from every bush, that they all jumped up, seized their arms, and were some time before they could undeceive themselves that they were really not attacked. In the morning the boats returned, and we were much concerned to hear that they had seen nothing of the jolly boat. The tender received a fresh supply of provisions and ammunition. At the same time, they had orders to cruise in a certain direction to look for the jolly boat, and Palmerston's Isles were appointed as the rendezvous to meet again. Lieutenant Corner now came on board in a canoe not much bigger than a butcher's tray. The cutter was sent a second time to search the reefs, but returned without success. We then run down with the ship in the direction of the wind had blown the preceding day, in hopes of finding the boat. But after a whole day's run to leeward, and working up again by traverses to the isles, saw nothing of her. The tender hove in sight in the evening, and we again searched the isles without success. All further hopes of seeing her were given up, 
and we proceeded on our voyage. It may be difficult to surmise what has been the fate of these unfortunate men. They had a piece of salt beef thrown into the boat to them on leaving the ship, and it rained a good deal that night and the following day, which might satiate their thirst. It is by these accidents the divine ruler of the universe has peopled the southern hemisphere. Here are innumerable islands in perpetual growth. The coral, a marine vegetable with which the South Seas in every part abounds, is continually shooting up from the bottom to the surface, which at first forms lagoon islands, and the water in the center is evaporated by the heat of the sun, till at last a terra firma is completed. In this state it would forever remain a barren sand, had not divine providence given birth to the coconut tree whose fruit is so protected with a hard shell that after floating about for a twelfth month in the sea it will vegetate take root and grow in those salt marshes lagoons incipient isles or whatever you please to call them their roots serve to bind the surface of the coral and the annual shedding of their leaves in time creates a soil which produces a verdure or undergrowth this affords a favorite resting place to sea fowls and the whole feathered race who in their dung drop the seeds of shrubs fruits and plants by which means all variety of the vegetable kingdom is disseminated at last the variegated landscape rises to view and when the divine architect has finished his work it becomes then a residence for man from the various accidents incident to man in the early stages of society, their wants, and the restless spirit inherent in their natures, they are tempted to dare the elements, either in fishing, commerce, or war, and from their termidity are often blown to remote and uninhabited islands. Distressing accidents of this nature often happening to inhabitants of the South Seas, they now seldom undertake any hazardous enterprise by water without a woman and a sow with pig being in the canoe with them by which means if they are cast on any of those uninhabited islands they fix their abode their remote situation from european powers has deprived them of the culture of civilized life as they neither serve to swell the ambitious views of conquest nor the avarice of commerce here the sacred finger of omnipotence has interposed and rendered our vices the instruments of virtue and although that unfortunate man christian has in a rash unguarded moment been tempted to swerve from his duty to his king and country as he is in other respects of an amiable character and respectable abilities should he elude the hand of justice it may be hoped he will employ his talents in humanizing the rude savages so that at some future period a british lion may ba blaze forth in the south with all the characteristic virtues of the english nation and complete the great prophecy by propagating the christian knowledge amongst the infidels as Christian has taken fourteen beautiful women with him from Otaheite, there is little doubt of his intention of colonizing some undiscovered island. On the sixth day of June we discovered an island which was named the Duke of York's Island. Lieutenants Corner and Hayward were sent out to examine it in the two little yawls covered by the tender. Some huts being discovered by the ship a signal was immediately made for the party on shore to be on their guard and to advance with caution soon after their arrival on shore a ship's wooden boy was discovered on searching the huts nets of different sizes were found hanging in them and a variety of fishing utensils stages and wharfs were likewise discovered in different parts of the creek which led us to imagine it was only an island resorted to in the fishing season by some neighboring nation the skeleton of a very large fish supposed to be a whale was found near the beach and a place of venerable aspect formed entirely by the hand of nature and resembling a druidical temple commanded their attention 
the falling of a very old large tree formed an arch through which the interior part of the temple was seen which heightened the perspective and gave a romantic solemn dignity to the scene at the extreme end of the temple three altars were placed the centre one higher than the other two on which some white shells were piled in regular order after traversing the island they returned to the huts and hung up a few knives looking-glasses and some little articles of european manufacture that the natives on their return might know that the island had been visited on the twelfth we discovered another island which was named the duke of clarence's island in running along the land we saw several canoes crossing the lagoons the tender signal was made to cover the boats in landing and lieutenants corner and haywood sent to reconnoitre the beach to discover a landing place in this duty they came pretty near some of the natives in their canoes who had made signs of peace to them but either from fear or business avoided having any intercourse with us morays or burying places were likewise found here which indicated it to be a principal residence here they find some old coconut trees hollowed longitudinally as tanks or reservoirs for rainwater. On the 18th we discovered an island of more considerable extent than any that had hitherto been discovered in the south, and as there were many collateral circumstances that might hereafter promise it to be a discovery of national importance, in honor of the first lord of the admiralty it was called Chatham's Island. It is beautifully diversified with hills and dales, of twice the extent of Tahiti, and a hardy, warlike race of people. The natives described a large river to us, which disembogued itself into a spacious bay that promises an excellent anchorage. Here we learned of the death of Finau, king of Anamooka, from one of his family of the same name, who had a finger cut off in mourning for him after trading a whole day with the natives who seemed fair and honourable in their dealings we examined it without success and proceeded on our voyage on the twenty first we discovered a very considerable island about forty miles long it was named by the natives otutu ila captain edwards gave it no name but should posterity derive the advantages from it which it at present promises I presume it may hereafter be called Edwards Island. It is well wooded, with immense large trees, whose foliage spreads like the oak, and there is a deal of shrubbery on it, bearing a yellow flower. The natives are remarkably handsome. Some of them had their skins tinged with yellow as a mark of distinction, which at first led us to imagine that they were diseased neither sex wear any clothing but a girdle of leaves round the middle stained with different colours the women adorn their hair with chaplets of sweet-smelling flowers and bracelets and necklaces of flowers round their waists and neck on their first coming on board they trembled with fear they were perfectly ignorant of firearms never having seen a european ship before they made many gestures of submission and were struck with wonder and surprise at everything they saw. Amongst other things, they brought us some remarkable fine puddings, which abounded with aromatic spices that excelled in taste and flavor the most delicate seed cake. As we have never hitherto known of spices or aromatics being in the South Seas, it is certainly a matter worthy of the investigation of some future circumnavigators. We traded with them the whole day, and got many curiosities. Birds and fowls of the most splendid plumage were brought on board, and some resembling the peacock, and a great variety of the parrot kind. One woman amongst the others came on board. She was six foot high, of exquisite beauty, and exact symmetry being naked and unconscious of being so, added to the luster of her charms. For, in the words of the poet, she need not the foreign ornaments of dress careless of beauty she was beauty itself 
Many mouths were watering for her, but Captain Edwards, with great humanity and prudence, had given previous orders that no woman should be permitted to go below, as our health had not quite recovered from the shock it received in Tahiti, and the lady was obliged to be contented with viewing the great cabin, where she was shown the wonders of the Lord on the face of the mighty deep. Before evening the women went all on shore, and the men began to be troublesome and pilfering. The third lieutenant had a new coat stolen out of his cabin, and they were making off with every bit of iron they could lay hands on. Now came the blow fresh, and we were obliged to make off from the land. Those who were engaged in trade on board were so anxious that we had got almost out of sight of their canoes before they perceived the ship's motion, which they all jumped into the water like a flock of wild geese. But one fellow, more earnest than the rest, hung by the rudder chains for a mile or two, thinking to detain her. This evening at five o'clock we unfortunately parted company and lost sight of our tender. False fires were burnt, and great guns and small arms were fired without success, as it came on thick blowing weather. We cruised for her all the twenty-third and twenty-fourth, near where we parted company, which was off a piece of remarkable high land. What was most unfortunate, water and provisions were then on deck for her, which were intended to have been put on board of her this morning. She had the day before received orders, in case of separation, to rendezvous at Anamooka, and to wait there for us. A small keg of salt, and another of nails and ironware, were likewise put on board of her, to traffic with the Indians, in the latitudes and longitudes of the places we would touch at in our intended route. She had a boarding netting fixed, to prevent her being boarded, and several seven-barreled pieces and blunderbusses put on board of her. As we proceeded to the eastward, we saw another island, which we knew to be one of the navigator's isles, discovered by Monsieur Bougainville. On the twenty-eighth in the morning, saw the Hape Islands, discovered by Captain Cook, and before noon, the group of islands to the eastward of Anamooka, and sailed down between Little Anamooka and Fall Afaji Island. On the twenty-ninth we anchored in the road at Anamooka. Immediately on our arrival a large sailing canoe was hired, and Lieutenant Hayward and one private sent to the Hape and Fiji Islands, to make inquiries after the bounty and our tender, but received no intelligence. Here they found an axe, which had been left by Captain Cook, and bartered with the natives of the different islands for hogs, yams, and etc. The people of Anamooka are the most daring set of robbers in the South Seas, and with the greatest deference and submission to Captain Cook, I think the name Friendly Islands is a perfect misnomer, as their behavior to himself, to us, and to Captain Bly's unfortunate boat at Murderer's Cove pretty clearly evinces. Indeed, Murderer's Cove in the Friendly Isles is saying a volume on the subject. Two or three of the officers were taking a walk on shore one evening, who had the precaution to take their pistols with them. They seemed to crowd round us with more than idle curiosity, but on presenting the pistols to them they sheared off. The captain soon joined us, and brought his servant with him, carrying a bag of nails and some trifling presents which he meant to distribute amongst them. But he took the bag from him, and dispatched him with a message to the boat, on which the crowd followed him. As soon as he got out of our sight, they stripped him naked, and robbed him of his clothes, and every article he had but one shoe, which he used for concealing his nakedness. At this juncture, Lieutenant Hayward arrived from his expedition, and called the assistance of the guard in searching for the robbers. We saw the natives all running and dodging behind trees, which led us to suspect there was some mischief brewing, but we soon discovered the great Irishman, with his shoe full in one hand, and a bayonet in the other, naked and foaming mad with revenge on the natives for the treatment he had received. Night coming on, we went on board without recovering the poor fellow's clothes. The next day we were honored with a visit from Tetafi, king of Anamooka, who was of lineal descent from the same family that reigned in the island when discovered by Tasman, the Dutch circumnavigator, 
and the story of his landing and supplying them with dogs and hogs is handed down by oral tradition to this day here society may be said to exist in the second stage with respect to otaheite as land is scarcer private property is more exactly ascertained and each man's possessions fenced in with a beautiful chinese railing highways and roads leading to public places are neatly fenced on each side and a handsome approach to their houses by a gravel walk with shrubbery planted with some degree of taste on each side of it many of them had rows of pineapples on each side of the avenue messrs hayward and corner with their usual benevolence took much pains in teaching them the manner of transplanting their pineapples which hint they immediately adopted and were very thankful of any advice either in rearing, rearing their fruit or cultivating their ground the shaddocks are superior in flavour to those in the west indies and they will soon have oranges from what we have left amongst them the women here are extremely beautiful and a although they want that feminine softness of manners which the otaheite woman possess in so eminent a degree their matchless vivacity and fine animated countenances compensate the want of softer blandishments of their sister island there is a favourite amusement of the ladies here the cup and ball such as children play at in england it serves to give them a degage kind of air by which means you have a more elegant display of their charms they are well aware of their fascinating powers and use them with much address as our fine women do knotting and in other acts of industry trade went briskly on they brought abundance of hogs and several ton weight of very excellent yams we found that pork took salt and was cured much better than at Otaheite. Many beautiful girls were bore, brought on board by their mothers, who were very exorbitant in their demands, as nothing less than a broad axe would satisfy them. But after standing their market three days, la pucelage fell to an old razor, a pair of scissors, or a very large nail. Indeed, this trade was pushed to so great a height that the quarter-deck became the scene of the most indelicate familiarities nor did the unfeeling mothers commiserate with the pain and suffering of the poor girls but seemed to enjoy it as a monstrous good thing it is customary here when girls meet with an accident of this kind that a council of matrons is held and the novitiate has a gash made in her forefinger we soon observed a number of cut fingers amongst them and had the razors held out i believe all the girls in the island would have undergone the same operation a party was sent on shore to cut wood for fuel and grass for the sheep but they would not permit a blade of grass to be cut till they were paid for it the watering party shared the same fate and notwithstanding a guard of armed men were sent to protect the others whilst on that duty the natives were continually harassing them and committing depredations one of them came behind lieutenant corner and made a blow at him with his club which luckily missed his head and only stunned him in the back of the neck and while in that state snatched his handkerchief from him but mr corner recovering before the thief got out of sight levelled his piece and shot him dead Tetefi, the king was going to collect tribute from the islands under his jurisdiction and went in the frigate to, to foa but previous to our sailing a letter was left to mr oliver the commander of the tender should he chance to arrive before our return makukala the principal chief held it in the night the burning mountain on tofoa exhibited a grand spectacle and in the morning two canoes were sent ashore to announce the arrival of those two great personages tetefi and tubu who went on shore in the pandora's barge to give them more consequence but the tributary princes came off in canoes to do homage to tetefi before he reached the shore they came alongside the barge lowered their heads over the side of the canoe and tetefi agreeable to their custom 
put his foot on their heads. When on shore, a presence he had received from us, he distributed amongst his subjects with a liberality worthy of a great prince. Some of the people were, who were here had behaved with savage barbarity to Captain Bly's boat at Murderer's Cove. They perfectly recollected Mr. Hayward, and seemed to shrink from him. Captain Edwards took much pains with Tetefi, the king, to make him sensible of his disapprobation of their conduct to Captain Bly's boat. But conciliatory and gentle means were all that can be enjoined at present, lest our tender should fall amongst them. The End of Chapter 2「Chapter Three of George Hamilton's A Voyage Round the World in His Majesty's Frigate Pandora, read here by Roy Schreiber. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage Round the World in His Majesty's Frigate Pandora. Chapter Three Voyage from Anamooka with an account of the loss of the Pandora. The wind not permitting us to visit Tongatobu, we proceeded to Katoa and the Navigator's Isles, the loss of our tender having prevented us from doing it before, and endeavoured to fall in with the easternmost of these isles. On the morning of the 12th of July, we discovered a cluster of islands in the northwest quarter, but the wind being favourable for us, left examining of them till our return to the friendly isles. On the 14th, in the forenoon, saw three isles, supposed to be the cluster of isles called by Bougainville Navigator's Isles. The largest the natives called Tumalua. We passed them at a little distance, and found much entreaty necessary to bring them on board. On the 15th we saw another island, which proved to be Otutu Ilala, which has already been described. Here we found some of the French navigators' clothing and buttons, and there is little doubt but they have murdered them. On the 18th saw the group of islands we discovered on our way here, and on the 19th ran down the north side till we had come to an opening where we saw the sea on the other side. A sound is formed here by some islands to the southeast and northwest, and the interior bays which promise better anchorage than any other place in the friendly isles. The natives told us that there were excellent watering places in several different parts within the sound. The country is well wooded. Several of the inferior chiefs were on board, one of the Tatafe and one of the Tubu family, but the principal chief was not on board. We supposed he was coming off just as we sailed. The natives in general were very fair and honourable in their dealings. They were more inoffensive and better behaved than any we have seen for some time. They have frequent intercourse with Anamuka, and their religion and customs and language are the same. A number of beautiful parakeets were brought off by the natives, all remarkable for the richness and variety of their plumage. The group of islands was called House Islands, but were particularly distinguished by the name of Barrington's, Sawyer's, Hottam's, and Jarvis Islands. The sound itself was called Curtis Sound. Under the general denomination of Howe's Island were included several islands to the southeast, to which we gave no particular name, and two more islands to the westward, called Bickerton's Islands, including two small islands near the above. There seems to be a tolerable landing place on the northwest side of Gardner's Island. All this part of the islands has the most barren aspect. There were evident marks of volcanic eruptions having happened. A very singular appearance which this part of the island presented, I cannot omit mentioning. It bore the figure of a piece of flat tableland, and without the slightest eminence or indentation, and smoke was issuing from the edges round its whole circumference. On the 23rd we passed an inhabited island, which we suppose to be Pilesart Island. It has two remarkable high peaks upon it. On the 26th we saw Middleburg Island, and run down between it and Iua, examined 
it without success. Past Tongatobu, got some provisions here, but found the water brackish. On the twenty-ninth, we anchored again in the road of Anamuka. We were sorry to hear the tender had not been there. On the fifth of August, we again proceeded on our voyage. As the occurrences at that time bore some semblance to the transactions in our last visit, to avoid wounding the delicate or satiating the licentious, we shall conclude in the torpid phraseology of the log with ditto repeated. Everything being ready for sea on the third day of August, we sailed from Anamuka, and on the fifth discovered an island of some considerable extent, called by the natives Unu Afau, which we call Proby's Island, in honor of Commissioner Proby. We traded with the inhabitants for some hours. The land was hilly, and the houses much larger construction than we had observed before in those seas. We were now convinced that we were further to the westward than we imagined, and therefore shaped a course to fall in to the eastward of Wallace's island, and the next day fell in with it. We gave presents, as was customary, to the first boat, who, from a theft they committed, were afraid to return. Their cheekbones were much bruised and flattened, and some had both their little fingers cut off. We bore away, attending to steer in the track of Carteret and Bly, between Spiritus Sancto and Santa Cruz, and on the eighth saw land to the westward. We sounded, but found no bottom. We run down the island, and saw a vast number of houses amongst the trees. It was very hilly, and from the great height of some of them may be called mountains. They were cultivated to the top, the reason of which, I presume, is from being so full of inhabitants. It is about seven miles long, and being a new discovery, we called it Grenville's Island, in honor of Lord Grenville. The name the natives gave it is Botuma. They came off in a fleet of canoes, rested on their paddles, and gave the war-hoop at stated periods. They were all armed with clubs and meant to attack us. But the magnitude and novelty of such an object as a man of war struck them with a mixture of wonder and fear. They were, however, perfectly ignorant of firearms, and seemed much startled at the report of a musket, were too shy to stand the experiment of a great gun. As they came off with hostile intentions, they brought no women with them. They wore necklaces, bracelets, and girdles of white shells. Their bodies were curiously marked with figures of men, dogs, fishes, and birds upon every part of them, so that every man was a moving landscape. These marks were all raised and done, I suppose, by pinching up the skin. They were great adepts in thieving, and uncommonly athletic and strong. One fellow was making off with some booty, but was detected, and although five of the stoutest men in the ship were hanging upon him, and had hold fast of his long flowing black hair, he overpowered them all, and jumped overboard with his prize. There is a high promontory on the island, which we named Mount Temple. On the eleventh, no land being then in sight, we run over a reef of coral at eleven fathom water. We were much alarmed, but passed it in five minutes, and on sounding immediately afterwards, found no bottom. This was called Pandora's Reef. On the twelfth, in the morning, we discovered an island well wooded, but not inhabited. It had two remarkable promontories on it, one resembling a mitre, and the other a steeple, from whence we called it Mitre Island. We passed it, and stood to the westward, and at ten the same morning discovered another island to the northwest. It is entirely cultivated, and has a vast number of inhabitants, though only a mile in length. The beach from the east, round by the south, is a white sand, but too much surf for a boat to attempt to land. In gratitude for the many good things we had on board, and the very high state of preservation in which they kept, we call this Cherry's Island, in honor of Mr. Cherry Esquire, Commissioner of the Victualling Office. On the 13th of August we discovered another island to the northwest. It is mountainous, and covered with wood to the very summit. We saw no inhabitants, but smoke in many different parts of it, from which it may be presumed it is inhabited. 
This we called Pitt's Island. On the 17th at midnight, we discovered breakers on each bow. We had just room to wear the ship, and as this merciful escape was from the vigilance of one Wells, who was looking out ahead, it was called Wells's Shoal. Those hairbreadth escapes may point out the propriety of a consort. In the morning, at daylight, we put about to examine the danger we were in, and found we had got embayed in a double reef, which will very soon be an island. We won run round its northwest end, and on the twenty-third saw land, which we supposed to be Louisiade, a cape bearing northeast and by east. We called it Cape Rodney. Another contiguous to it was called Cape Hood, and a mountain between them we named Mount Clarence. After passing Cape Hood, the land appears lower, and to trench away about northwest, forming a deep bay, and it may be doubted whether it joins New Guinea or not. We pursued our course to the westward, keeping Endeavour Straits open, by which means we hoped to avoid the dangers Captain Cook met with in the higher latitudes. On the 25th saw breakers hauled up and passed to the westward of them. The sea broke very gently on them. To these we gave the name of Lookout Shoals. Before noon we saw more breakers, the reef of which was composed of very large stones, and called it Stony Reef Island. On seeing obstructions to the southward, stood to the westward, where there appeared to be an opening. We saw an island in that direction, and a reef extending a considerable way to the northwest. Hauled up the wind, seeing our passage obstructed, and stood off and on under an easy sail in night till daylight. In the morning bore away and discovered four islands to which the name of Murray's Islands was given. On top of the largest there was something resembling a fortification. We saw at the same time three two-masted boats. We kept running along the reef, and in the forenoon thought we saw an opening. Lieutenant Corner was immediately ordered to get ready to discover if there was a passage for the ship, and went to the topmast to look round him before he left us. It was judged necessary that he should take with him an axe, some fuel, provisions, a little water, and a compass previous to his departure. It was now the 28th of August. It had lately been our custom to lay two in the night, M. Bougainville having represented this part of the ocean as exceedingly dangerous, and it certainly is the boldest piece of navigation that ever has been attempted. We would gladly have continued the same custom, but the great length of the voyage would not permit it, as, after we passed to the westward of Bougainville's track, the ocean was perfectly unexplored. At five in the afternoon a signal was made from the boat that a passage through the reef was discovered for the ship, but wishing to be well informed in so intricate a business, and the day being far spent, we waited the boats coming on board, made a signal to expedite her, and afterwards repeated it, night closing fast upon us, and considering our former misfortunes of losing the tender and the jolly boat, rendered it necessary, both for the preservation of the boat and the success of the voyage, to endeavor by every means possible to get hold of her. False fires were burnt, and muskets fired from the ship, and answered by the boat reciprocally, as the flashes from their muskets were distinctly seen by us, she was reasonably soon expected on board. We now sounded, but had no bottom, with a hundred and ten fathom line, till past seven o'clock, when we got ground at fifty fathom. The boat was now seen close under the stern. We were at the same time lying to, to prevent the ship fore-reaching. Immediately on sounding this last time, the topsails were filled, but before the tacks were hauled on board, and the sails trimmed, she struck on a reef of rocks, and at that instant the boat got on board. Every possible 
effort was attempted to get her off by the sails, but failing, they were furled, and the boats hoisted out, with a view to carry out an anchor. Before that was accomplished, the carpenter reported that she made eighteen inches of water in five minutes. In a quarter of an hour more, she had nine feet of water in the hold. The hands were immediately turned to the pumps, to bail at different hatchways. Some of the prisoners were let out of irons, and turned to the pumps. At this dreadful crisis it blew very violently, and she beat so hard upon the rocks that we expected her every minute to go to pieces. It was an exceedingly dark and stormy night, and the gloomy horrors of death presented all round, being everywhere encompassed with rocks, shoals, and broken water. About ten she beat over the reef, and we let go the anchor in fifteen fathom water. The guns were ordered to be thrown overboard, and what hands could be spared from the pumps were employed thrumming a topsail to haul under her bottom to endeavor to fodder her. To add to our distress, at this juncture one of the chain pumps gave way, and she gained fast upon us. The scheme of the topsail was now laid aside, and every soul fell to bailing and pumping. All the boats, excepting one, were obliged to keep a long distance off on account of the broken water, and the very high surf that was running near us. We bailed between life and death, for had she gone down before daylight, every soul must have perished. She now took a heel, and some of the guns that were endeavoring to be thrown overboard run down to leeward, which crushed one man to death. About the same time, a spare topmast came down from the boom and killed another man the people now became faint at the pumps and it was necessary to give them some refreshment we had luckily between the decks a cask of exceedingly strong ale which was brewed at anamooka this was tapped and served regularly to all hands which was much preferable to spirits as it gave them strength without intoxication during this trying occasion the men behaved with the utmost intrepidity and obedience, not a man flinching from his post. We continually cheered them at the pumps with the delusive hopes of it being daylight soon. About half an hour before daybreak a council of war was held among the officers, and she was then settling fast in the water it was their unanimous opinion that nothing further could be done for the preservation of his majesty's ship and it was their next care to save the lives of the crew to effect which spars booms hen coops everything buoyant was cut loose that when she went down they might chance to get hold of something the prisoners were ordered let out of irons the water was now coming in fast in the gun ports that the pump could not discharge and at, to this minute the men never swerved from their duty she now took a very heavy heel so much so that she lay quite on one side one of the officers now told the captain who was standing aft that the anchor on our bow was under water and that she was then going and bidding him farewell jumped over the quarter into the water the captain then followed his example and jumped after him at that instant she took her last heel and while every one was scrambling to windward she sank in an instant the crew had just time to leap overboard accompanying it with a most dreadful yell the cries of men drowning in the water was at first awful in the extreme but as they sunk and became faint died away by degrees the boats who were at some considerable distance in the drift of the tide in about a half hour or a little better picked up the remainder of our wretched crew morning now dawned and the sun shone out a sandy key four miles off and about thirty paces long afforded us a resting place when all the boats arrived we mustered our remains and found that thirty-five men and four prisoners had drowned after we had a little recovered our strength the first care was to haul up the boats a guard was placed over the prisoners providentially a small barrel of water a keg of wine some biscuit and a few muskets and cartridge boxes had been thrown into the boat 
The heat of the sun and the reflection from the sand was now excruciating, and our stomachs being filled with salt water, from the great length of time we were swimming before we were picked up, rendered our thirst most intolerable, and no water was allowed to be served out the first day. By a calculation which we made, by filling compass boxes and every utensil we had, we could admit of an allowance of two small wine glasses of water a day to each man for sixteen days. A saw and a hammer had fortunately been in one of the boats, which enabled us, with the greater expedition, to make preparations for our voyage by repairing one of the boats, which was in very bad state, and cutting up the floorboards of all the boats into uprights, round which we stretched canvas to keep the water from breaking into the boats at sea. We made tents of the boat's sails, and when it was dark we set the watch and went to sleep. In the night we were disturbed by the irregular behavior of one Connell, which led us to suspect he had stole our wine and got drunk, but on further inquiry we found that the excruciating torture he suffered from thirst had led him to drink salt water, by which means he went mad, and died in the sequel of the voyage. Next morning Mr. George Passmore, the master, was dispatched in one of the boats to visit the wreck to see if anything floated round her that might be useful to us in our present distressed state. He returned in two hours, and brought with him a cat, which he found clinging to the top gallant masthead, a piece of top gallant mast, which he cut away, and about fifteen feet of lightning chain, which being copper, we cut up and converted into nails for fitting out the boats. Some of the gigantic cockle was boiled, and cut into junks, lest any one should be inclined to eat but our thirst was too excessive to bear anything that would increase it. This evening a glass of water was served to each man. A paper parcel of tea having been thrown into the boat, the officers joined all their allowance, and had tea in the captain's tent with him. When it was boiled, every one took a salt cellar spoonful and passed it to his neighbor, by which means we moistened our mouths, and by slow degrees received very much refreshment from it. The end of chapter three. Chapter four of George Hamilton's A Voyage Round the World in His Majesty's Frigate Pandora, read here by Roy Schreiber. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter four. Voyage from the Wreck to the Island of Timor. Everything being ready on the following day, at twelve o'clock, we embarked in our little squadron, each boat having been previously supplied with the latitude and longitude of the island of Timor, eleven hundred miles from this place. Our order of sailing was as follows. In the pinnace, Captain Edwards, Lieutenant Hayward, Mr. Rickards, Master's Mate, Mr. Packer, Gunner, Mr. Edmonds, Captain's Clerk, three prisoners, sixteen privates. In the Red Yawl, Lieutenant Larkin, Mr. George Hamilton, surgeon, Mr. Reynolds, master's mate, Mr. Madsen, midshipman, two prisoners and eighteen privates. In the Launch, Lieutenant Corner, Mr. Gregory Bentham, prisoner, Mr. Montgomery, carpenter, Mr. Bowling, master's mate, Mr. McKendrick, midshipman, two prisoners and twenty-four privates. In the Blue Yawl, Mr. George Passmore, master, Mr. Cunningham, boatswain, Mr. James Innes, surgeon's mate, Mr. Fenwick, midshipman, Mr. Pycroft, midshipman, three prisoners and fifteen privates. As soon as we embarked, we laid the oars upon the thwarts, which formed a platform by which means we stowed two tier of men, a pair of wooden scales was made in each boat, and a musket-ball weight of bread served to each man. At the meridian we saw a key bounded with large craggy rocks. As the principal part of our sustenance was in the launch, it was necessary to keep together, both for our defense and support. We towed each other during the night, and at daybreak cast off the tow-line. 
At eight in the morning, the red and blue yawls were sent ahead to sound and investigate the coast of New South Wales, and to search for a watering place. The country had been described as very destitute of that article of water, but on entering a very fine bay, we found most excellent water rushing from a spring at the very edge of the beach. Here we filled our bellies, a tea kettle, and two quart bottles. The pinnace and launch had gone too far ahead to observe any signal of our success, and immediately we made sail after them. The coast has a very barren aspect, and from the appearance of the soil and land, looks like a country abounding with minerals. As we passed round the bay, two canoes, with three black men in each, put off and paddled very hard to get near us. They stood up in the canoes, waved, and made many signals for us to come to them. But as they were perfectly naked, had a very savage aspect, and having heard an indifferent account of the natives of that country, we judged it prudent to avoid them. In two hours we joined the pinnace and the launch, who were lying to for us. At ten at night we were alarmed with the dreadful cry of breakers ahead. We had got amongst a reef of rocks, and in our present state, being worn out and fatigued, it is difficult to say how we got out of them, as the place was fraught with dangers all round, for in standing clear of Scylla we might fall afoul of Charybdis, the horror of which, considering our present situation, may be better understood than expressed. After running along, we came to an inhabited island, from which we promised ourselves a supply of water. On our approach, the natives flocked to the beach in crowds. They were jet black, and neither sex had either covering or girdle. We made signals of distress to them for something to drink, which they understood, and on receiving some trifling presents of knives and some buttons cut off our coats, they brought us a keg of good water, which we emptied in a minute, and then sent it back to be filled again. They, however, would not bring it the second time put it down on the beach, and made signs to us to come on shore for it. This we declined, as we observed the women and the children running, and supplying the men with bows and arrows. In a few minutes they let fly a shower of arrows amongst the thick of us. Luckily we had not a man wounded, but an arrow fell between the captain and the third lieutenant, and went through the boat's thwart, and stuck in it. It was an oak plank an inch thick. We immediately discharged a volley of muskets at them, which put them to flight. There were, however, none of them killed. We now abandon all hopes of refreshment here. This island lies contiguous to Mountainous Island. It may be observed that the channel throughout the reef is better than any hitherto known. We ascertained the latitudes with the greatest accuracy and exactness and should government be inclined to plant trees on those sandy keys, particularly the outermost one, it would be a good distinguishing mark, and many difficulties which Captain Cook experienced to southward would also be avoided. The coconut tree, on account of its hardy nature, and the Norfolk and common pines might be preferred for their height, rendering the place more conspicuous. The tides are current, are strong and irregular here, as may be expected from the extending reef, the shoals and the keys, and its vicinity to the Endeavour Straits. We steered from these hostile savages to other islands in sight, and sent some armed men on shore with orders to keep pretty near us, and to run close along the shore in the boats. But they returned without success. This island we called Plum Island from its bearing an austere, astringent kind of fruit, resembling plums, but not fit to eat. In the evening we steered for those islands which we supposed were called the Prince of Wales's Islands, and about two o'clock in the morning came to an anchor with a grappling, alongside of an island which we called La Forêt's Island, as the night was very dark, and this was the last land that could afford us relief, all hands went to sleep to refresh our woe-worn spirits. The morning was ushered in with the howling of wolves who had smelt us in the night and were prowling for food. 
Lieutenant Corner and a party were sent at daylight to search again for water, and, as we approached, the wild beasts retired and filled the woods with their hideous growling. As soon as we landed, we discovered a footpath, which led down to a hollow, where we were led to suspect that water might be found, and on digging four or five feet, we had the ecstatic pleasure to see a spring rush out. A glad messenger immediately dispatched to the beach to make signal to the boats of our success. On traversing the shore, we discovered a moray, or rather, a heap of bones. There amongst them were two human skulls, the bones of some large animals, and some turtle bones. They were heaped together in the form of a grave, and a very long paddle supported at each end by a bifurcated branch of a tree was laid horizontally alongst it. Near to this there were marks of a fire having been recently made. The ground about was much footed and wore, whence it may be presumed feasts or sacrifices had frequently been held, as there were several footpaths which led to this spot. After having gorged our parched bodies with water till we were perfectly waterlogged, we began to feel the cravings of hunger, a new sensation of misery we had hitherto been strangers to from the excess of thirst predominating. Some of our stragglers were lucky enough to find a few small oysters on the shore, a harsh, austere, astringent kind of fruit resembling a plum was found in some places as I discovered some to be pecked at by the birds who permitted the men to fill their bellies with them. There was a small berry of a similar taste to the plum, which was found by some of the party. On observing dung of some of the large animals, many of them were found in it in an undigested state. We therefore concluded we might venture upon them with safety. We carefully avoided shooting any bird, lest the report of our muskets should alarm the natives, whom we had every reason to suspect were at no great distance from the number of footpaths that led over the hill, and the noise we heard at intervals. Sentinels were placed to prevent stragglers of our party from exceeding the proper bounds, and when every other thing was filled with water, the carpenter's boots were also filled. The water in them was the first served out on account of the leakage. There is a large sound form here, to which we gave the name Sandwiches Sound, and commodious anchorage for shipping in the bay, to which we gave the name Wolf's Bay, in which there is five to seven fathom of water all round. This is extremely well situated for a rendezvous in surveying Endeavour Straits, and were a little colony settled here, a contentation of Christian settlements would enchain the world, and be useful to any unfortunate ship of whatever nation that might be wrecked in these seas, or, should a rupture take place in South America, a great vein of commerce might find its way through this channel. Hammond's Island lies northwest and by north, Parker's Island from north and by west to north, and by east, and an island seen to the north entrance northwest. We supposed it to be an island called Mountainous Island by Captain Bly, laid down in latitude ten, sixteen minutes south. Sandwiches Sound is formed by Hammonds, Parkers, and a cluster of small islands on the starboard hand at the eastern entrance. We also called a backland behind Hammond's Island, and the other islands to the southward of it, Cornwallis's Land. The uppermost part of the mountain was separated from the main by a large gap. Under the gap lowland was seen, but whether that was a continuation of the main or not we could not determine. Near the center of the sound is a small dark-colored rocky island. This afternoon at three o'clock, being the second of September, our little squadron sailed again, 
and in the evening saw a high-peaked island lying northwest, which we called Hawkesbury's Island. The passage through the north entrance is about two miles wide. After passing through it, saw a reef. As we approached, we shallowed out our water at three fathom, but on hauling up more southwest, we deepened it again to six fathom. Saw several very large turtle, but could not catch any of them. After clearing the reef, stood to the westward, mountainous island or north half east, Captain Bly's West Island, which appears in the three hummocks, north northwest, a rock northwest at the southwest extreme of the mainland, south and by east, and on the northernmost cape of New South Wales, south southeast, and to the extreme of the land in sight, the eastward, east, half north, a small distance from the entrance to the nearest of Prince of Wales Islands. We discovered another island, and which we called Christian's Island. Saw two hummocks between Hawkesbury's Island and Mountainous Island, but could not be certain whether it was one or two islands. We now entered the great Indian Ocean, and had a voyage of a thousand miles to undertake in our open boats. As soon as we cleared the land, we found a very heavy swell running, which threatened destruction to our little fleet. For should we have separated, we must inevitably perish for want of water, as we had no utensils to divide our slender stock. For our mutual preservation, we took each other in tow again. But the sea was so rough, and the swell running so high, we towed very hard, and broke a new tow-line. This put us in the utmost confusion, being afraid of dashing to pieces upon each other, as it was very dark in the night. We again made fast to each other. The tow-line breaking a second time, we were obliged to trust ourselves to the mercy of the waves. At five in the morning, the pinnace lay to, as the other boats had passed under a dark cloud. But on the signal being made for the boats to join, we again met at daylight. At the meridian we passed some remarkable black and yellow striped sea snakes. At the afternoon of the 4th of September we gave out the exact latitude of our rendezvous in writing, also the longitude by the timekeeper at this present time in case of unavoidable separation. On the night between the 5th and the 6th, the sea running very cross and high, the tow-line broke several times, the boat strained, and made much water, and we were obliged to leave off towing the rest of the voyage, or it would have dragged the boats asunder. On the 7th the captain caught a booby. They sucked his blood, and divided him into twenty-four shares. The men who were employed steering the boats were often subject to a coup de soleil, as every one else was continually wetting their shirts overboard and putting it upon their head, which alleviated the scorching heat of the sun to which we were entirely exposed, most of us having lost our hats while swimming at the time the ship was wrecked. It may be observed that this method of wetting our bodies with salt water is not advisable. If the misery is protracted beyond three or four days, as, at that time, the great absorption from the skin that takes place from the increased heat and fever makes the fluids become tainted with the bittern of the salt water, so much so that the saliva became intolerable in the mouth, it may likewise be worthy of remark that those who drank their own urine died in the sequel of the voyage. We now neglected weighing our slender allowance of bread, our mouths becoming so parched that few attempted to eat, and what was not claimed was thrown into the general stock. We found old people suffer much more than those that were young. A particular instance of that we observed in one young boy, a midshipman, who sold his allowance of water two days for one allowance of bread. As their sufferings continued, they became very cross and savage in their temper. 
in the captain's boat one of the prisoners took to praying and they gathered round him with much attention and seeming devotion but the captain suspecting the purity of his doctrines and unwilling he should make a monopoly of the business gave prayers himself on the ninth we passed a great many of the nautilus fish the shell of which served us to put our glass of water into by which means we had more time granted to dip our fingers in it and wet our mouths by slow degrees there were several flocks of birds seen flying in a direction for land on the thirteenth in the morning we saw the land and the discoverer was immediately rewarded rewarded with a glass of water but as our cup of misery was not completely full it fell a dead calm the boats now all separated every one pushing to make the land next day we got pretty near it but there was a prodigious surf running two of our men slung a bottle about their necks jumped overboard and swam through the surf they traversed over a good many miles till a creek intercepted them when they came down to the beach and made signs to us of their not having succeeded we then brought the boat as near the surf as we durst venture and picked them up in running along the coast about twelve o'clock we had the pleasure to see the red yawl get into a creek she had hoisted the english jack at her masthead that we might observe her in the running down the coast there was a prodigious surf and many dangerous shoals between us and the mouth of the creek we however began to share the remains of our water and about half a bottle came to each man's share which we dispatched in an instant we now gained fresh spirits and hazarded everything in gaining our so much wished for haven it is but justice here to acknowledge how much we were indebted to the intrepidity courage and seamanlike behavior of mr reynolds the master's mate who fairly beat her over the reefs and brought us safe on shore the crew of the blue yawl who had been two or three hours landed assisted in landing our party a fine spring of water near to the creek afforded us immediate relief as soon as we had filled our belly a guard was placed over the prisoners and we went to sleep for a few hours on the grass in the afternoon a chinese chief came along the creek in a canoe attended by some of the natives to wait upon us he was a venerable looking old man we endeavored to walk down to the waterside to receive him and acquaint him with the nature of our distress we addressed him in french and in english neither of which he understood but misery was so strongly depicted in our countenances that language was superfluous the tears trickling down his venerable cheeks convinced us he saw and felt our misfortunes and silence was eloquence on the subject he made us understand by signs that without fee or reward we should be supplied with horses and conducted to kupang a dutch east india settlement about seventy miles distant the place of our rendezvous this we politely declined as the nature of our duty in the charge of the prisoners would not admit of it we took leave of him for the present after receiving promises of refreshment soon after crowds of the natives came down with fowls pigs milk and bread mr innes the surgeon's mate happened luckily to have some silver in his pocket to which they applied the touchstone but would not give us anything for the guineas however anchor buttons answered the purpose as they gave us provisions for a few buttons which they refused the same number of guineas for till a hungry dog one of the carpenter's crew happening to pick up an officer's jacket spoiled the market by giving it buttons and all for a pair of fowls which a few buttons might have purchased all hands were busied in roasting the fowls and boiling the pork in the evening we made a very hearty supper we were regaling ourselves round a large fire when some beast gave a roar in the bushes some who had been in india before declared it was the jackal 
We therefore concluded that the lion could not be far off. Some were jocularly observing what a glorious supper the lord of the forest would make of us, but others were rather troubled with the dismals. This gave a gloomy turn to the conversation, and our minds having been previously much engaged with savages and wild beasts, and our bodies worn out through famine and watching, I believe the contagious effect of fear became pretty general. From Bly's narrative and others, we had been warned of the dangers of landing in any other part of the island of Timor but Kupang, the Dutch settlement, as they were represented hostile and savage. It is customary with those people, as we afterwards learnt, to do their hard work, such as beating of their rice at night, to avoid the scorching heat of the sun, and the whole village, which was about two miles off, joined in the general song, which everywhere cheers and accompanies labour. As they had made us great offers for some cartridges of powder, which our duty could not suffer us to part with, we immediately interpreted this song as a war-hoop, and concluded that they were going to take by force what they could not gain by entreaty. Nature, however, at last worn out, inclined to rest. The first lieutenant and master went on board the boats, which were anchored in the middle of the river, for the better security of the prisoners, and, ranging ourselves round with our feet to the fire, we went to sleep. At dawn of day the master gave the huntsman's hallow, which some, from being suddenly awakened, thought they were attacked by the Indians. We were all panic-struck, and could not get thoroughly awaked, being so exhausted and overpowered with sleep. Most of us were scrambling upon all fours to the river, and crying for Christ's sake to have mercy upon them, till those who were foremost in the scramble, in crawling into the creek, got recovered from their plight by their hands being immersed in the water. Yet those who were the foremost in running away were not the last in upbraiding the rest with cowardice, notwithstanding there were pretty evident marks upon some of them, of the cold water having produced its usual effect of urination. Next day we went up the creek in one of the boats about four miles to one of their towns with the intention of purchasing provisions for our sea store. As we entered the town, the king was riding out, attended by twenty bodyguards, well mounted and respectably armed. He passed us with all the sang-froid imaginable, scarce deigning to glance at us. In purchasing a pig, the man finding a good price for it, offered to traffic with us for the charms of his daughter, a very pretty young girl. But none of us seemed inclined that way, as there were many good things we stood much more in need of. At one o'clock, being high water, we embarked again in our boats for Compiègne. We sailed along coast all day till it was dark, and fearful lest we overshoot our port in the night, put into a bay. After lying some time we observed a light, and after hallowing and making a noise, the natives came down with torches in their hands, waited up alongside of us, and offered their assistance, which we accepted of, in the lighting of fires and the dressing of victuals we had brought with us, that no time might be lost in landing or cooking the next day. At daybreak we again proceeded on our voyage, and at five in the afternoon we landed at Coupang. The governor, Meinherr Vagnon, received us with the utmost politeness, kindness, and hospitality. The lieutenant governor, Meinherr Fry, was likewise extremely kind and attentive in rendering every assistance possible, and in giving the necessary orders for our support and relief in our present distressed state. The next morning being Sunday, as we supposed, the 17th of September, we prepared for church to return thanks to Almighty God for his divine interposition in our miraculous preservation. But we were disappointed in our pious intentions. For we found it was Monday, the 18th, having lost a day by performing a circuit of the globe to the westward. The End of Chapter 4
of a voyage round the world in his majesty's frigate pandora by george hamilton chapter five of george hamilton's a voyage round the world in his majesty's frigate pandora read here by roy schreiber this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five occurrences at Coupang, voyage to batavia and etc arrival in england this is the montpellier of the east to the dutch and portuguese settlements in india and from the salubrity of its air is the favorite resort of valetudinarians and invalids from batavia and other places this island is fertile variegated with hill and dale and equally beautiful as diversified with roti and its appendant islands it is as large as the island of great britain its principal trade is wax honey and sandalwood but the whole of its revenues do not defray the expense of the settlement to the company but from the locality of its situation it is convenient for their other islands they had the monopoly of sandalwood trade which is used in all the temples mosques and places of worship in the east every chinese having a sprig of it burning day and night near their household gods the exclusive trade of sandalwood was valuable and convenient to the dutch but from the vast extent of territory lately acquired in india we have plenty of that commodity without going to the dutch market close to the dutch town is a chinese town and temple they have a governor of their own nation but pay large tribute to the dutch notwithstanding their trade is under very severe restrictions they soon make rich and as soon as they become independent return to their own country for european and indian goods the natives barter their produce and sell their prisoners of war who are carried to batavia as slaves and the natives of java sent from batavia to this place in return as they hold their tenure more from policy than strength it would be in politic to irritate them by exposing their countrymen subjugated to the lash of slavery and oppression an instance of the soul cooping business fell under our inspection while here one of the petty princes in settling his account with a merchant of this place was some dollars short of cash he just stepped to the door and casting his eye on an elderly man who was near him laid hold of him and with the assistance of some of his mirrodons gave him up as a slave and so settled the account we felt more interested in the fate of this poor wretch on account of his having been a prince himself and never before saw the face of his oppressor he went passenger in the ship with us to batavia it was a pleasing and flattering sight to an englishman at the remotest corner of the globe to see that wedgwood stoneware and birmingham goods had found their way into the shops of coupang during our five weeks' stay here, the governor, Mynheer Vanion, by every act of politeness and attention, endeavored to make us spend our time agreeably. We were sumptuously regaled at his table every day, and the evening was spent with cards and concerts. I could dwell with pleasure for an age in praise of this honest Dutchman. It is the tribute of a grateful heart and his due. This is the third time he has had an opportunity of extending his hospitality to shipwrecked Englishmen. About a fortnight before we arrived, a boat with eight men, a woman, and two children came on shore here, who told him that they were supercargo, part of the crew and the passengers of an English brig wrecked in these seas. His house, which has ever been the asylum of dis the distressed, was open for their reception. They drew bills on the British government and were supplied with every necessary they stood in need of. The captain of a Dutch East Indiaman who spoke English, hearing of the arrival of Captain Edwards and our unfortunate boat, run to them with the glad tidings of their captain having arrived, but one of them, starting up in surprise, said, 
"'What captain? Damn me! We have no captain!' For they had reported that the captain and the remainder of the crew had separated from them at sea in another boat. This immediately led to a suspicion of their being impostors, and they were ordered to be apprehended and put into the castle. One of the men and the woman fled into the woods, but were soon taken. They confessed they were English convicts, and that they had made their escape from Botany Bay. They had been supplied with a quadrant, a compass, a chart, and some small arms and ammunition from a Dutch ship that lay there. And the expedition was conducted by the governor's fisherman, whose time of transportation was expired. He was a good seaman and a tolerable navigator. They dragged along the coast of New South Wales, and as often as the hostile nature of the savage natives would permit, hauled their boat up at night and slept on shore. They met with several curious and interesting anecdotes in this voyage. In many places of the coast of South Wales, they found very good coal, a circumstance that was not before known. Our men were now beginning to regain their strength, and Captain Doddleberg of the Rampang Indiaman was making every possible dispatch with his ship to carry us to Batavia. During this time, the internment of Balthazar, king of Kupang, was performed with funeral pomp. The governor, lieutenant governor, and all the Europeans were invited. Six months had been spent in preparation for this fete, at which an emperor and twenty-five kings assisted and attended in person with all their bodyguards. Standards and standard-bearers were present. When the corpse was deposited in the sepulchre, the company troops fired three volleys, and victuals and drink were immediately served to four thousand people. The Dutch and the English officers were invited to a very sumptuous dinner at a table provided for the emperor and all the kings. The first toast after dinner was the dead king's health. Next they drank Mynheer Company's health, which was accompanied with a volley of small arms and peteros. The singularity of Mynheer's Company's health led us to request an explanation when we were informed, they found it necessary to make them believe that Mynheer Company was a great and powerful king, lest they should not be inclined to pay that submission to a company of merchants. The inaugural ceremony at the installation of the young king was performed by his drinking a bumper of brandy and gunpowder stirred round with the point of a sword. After being invested with the regal dignity, he came down in state to pay his respects to the governor. As he was preceded by music and colors flying, every one turned out to see him. Amongst the rest was a captive king in chains, who was employed blowing the bellows to our armorer, whilst he was forging bolts and fetters for our prisoners and convicts. Here the sunshine of prosperity and the mutability of human greatness were excellently portrayed. By a policy in the Dutch in supplying petty princes with ammunition and warlike stores, feuds and dissensions are kindled amongst them, and they are kept so completely engaged in civil war that they have no time to observe the encroachment of strangers. That domestic strife serves, likewise, amply to supply the slave trade from the prisoners of both parties. They, however, some time since, made head against the common enemy, and forced the Dutch to retire to their trenches. It is the custom in this climate to bathe morning and evening. A fine river which runs in the center of the town is conveniently situated for that purpose, and we availed ourselves of it when our strength would permit. Nature had been profusely lavish in producing, in the neighborhood of this place, all the varied powers of landscape that the most luxuriant fancy can suggest. But, while enjoying the picturesque beauty, beauties of the scene, or sheltering in the translucent stream from the fervor of the meridian heat, you are suddenly chilled with fear from the terrific aspect of the alligator or the crested snake, and a number of venomous reptiles with which this country abounds. There is one in particular called the cock-cock. 
It is the most disgusting-looking animal that creeps the ground, and its bite is mortal. It is about a foot and a half long, and seems a production between a toad and a lizard. At stated periods it makes a noise exactly like a cuckoo clock. Even the natives fly from it with the utmost horror. The alligators are daring and numerous. There are instances of their devouring men and children when bathing in the shallow part of the river above the town. The governor, Meinherr Vanyan, relates a circumstance that happened to him while hunting. In crossing a shallow part of the river, his black boy was snapped up by an alligator, but the governor immediately dismounted, rescued the boy out of his mouth, and slew him. The natives of Timor are subject to a cutaneous disease during their infancy, something similar to the smallpox, but of a longer duration. It seldom terminates fatally, and only seizes them once in their lives. On the 6th of October we embarked on board the Rembang Dutch Indiamen, taking with us the prisoners and convicts. Our crew became very sickly in passing the Straits of Alas. We had frequent calms and sultry weather, weather until the 12th. In passing the island of Flores, a most tremendous storm arose. In a few minutes every sail of the ship was shivered to pieces, and pumps all choked and useless. The leak gaining fast upon us, and she was diving down, with all the impetuosity imaginable, on a savage shore about seven miles under our lee. The storm was attended with the most dreadful thunder and lightning we had ever experienced. The Dutch seamen were struck with horror, and went below, and the ship was preserved from destruction by the manly exertions of our English tars, whose souls seemed to catch redoubled ardor from the tempest rage. Indeed, it is only in these trying moments of distress, when the abyss of destruction is yawning to receive them, that the transcendent worth of the British seamen is most conspicuous. Nor would I wish, from what I have observed above, to throw any stigma on the Dutch, who I believe would fight the devil should he appear in any other shape but that of thunder and lightning. It may be remarked that the straits of Alas are not so dangerous as those of Sapi, and are for many reasons preferable. But it is so intricate a navigation that a Dutchman bound from Timor to Batavia, after beating about for twelve months, found himself exactly where he started from. On the twenty-first we got through, alas, and saw three prow vessels, who were a very daring set of pirates that infest those seas. On the twenty-second, saw the islands of Kakajung and Ilk, and run through the channel between them. The next day we saw the island of Madura. On the twenty-sixth, saw the island of Java, and on the thirtieth, anchored at Samarang. Immediately on our coming to anchor, we were agreeably surprised to find our tender here, which we had so long given up for lost. Never was social affection more eminently portrayed than in the meeting of these poor fellows, and from excesses of joy and the recital of their mutual sufferings from pestilence, famine, and shipwreck, a flood of tears filled every man's breast. They informed us, the night they parted company with us, the savages attacked them in a regular and powerful body in their canoes, and their never having seen a European ship before, nor being able to conceive any idea of firearms, made the conflict last longer than otherwise it would, for, seeing no missive weapon used of, when their companions were killed, they did not suspect anything to be the matter with them as they tumbled into the water. Our seven-barreled pieces made great havoc amongst them. One fellow had agility enough to spring over the boarding net, and was leveling a blow of his war-club at Mr. Oliver, the commanding officer, who had the good fortune to shoot him. On not finding the ship the next day, they gave up all further hopes of her, and steered for Anamooka, 
the rendezvous Captain Edwards had appointed. Their distress for want of water, if possible, surpassed that of our own, and had so strong an effect on one of the young gentlemen that the day following he became delirious, and continued so for some months after it. They at last made the island of Tofoa near Anamooka, which they mistook for it. After trading with the natives for provisions and water, they made an attempt to take the vessel from them, which they always will to a small vessel when alone, but they were soon overpowered with the firearms. They were, however, obliged to be much on their guard afterwards at those islands which were inhabited. After much diversity of distress and similar encounters, they at last made the reef that runs between New Guinea and New Holland, where the Pandora met her unhappy fate. And after traversing from shore to shore without finding an opening, this intrepid young seaman boldly gave it the stem and beat over the reef. The alternative was dreadful, as famine presented them on the one hand and shipwreck on the other. Soon after they passed Endeavour Straits, they fell in with a small Dutch vessel, who showed them every tenderness that the nature of their distress required. They were soon landed at a small Dutch settlement, but the governor, having a description of the bounty pirates from our court, and their vessel being built of foreign timber, served to confirm them in their suspicions, and as no officer in the British Navy bears a commission or warrant under the rank of lieutenant, where, by seal of office, their person or quality may be identified, they had only their bare ipsy dixit to depend on. They, however, behaved to them with the greatest precaution and humanity. Although they kept a strict guard over them, nothing was withheld to render their situation agreeable, and they were sent under proper escort to this place. This settlement is reckoned next to Batavia, and is so lucrative that the governor is changed every five years. The present governor's name is Overstaten, a gentleman of splendid taste and unbounded hospitality, who lives in a princely style, and to the otium dignitate of the Asiatic luxury, has the happiness to join the honest, hearty Dutch welcome. A regiment of the Duke of Württemberg's is doing duty here, amongst whom were several men of rank and fashion, who showed us very much civility and politeness. The town is regular and beautiful, and the houses are built in a style of architecture which has given lose to the most sportive fancy. Each street is terminated with some public building, such as a great marine school for the education of young officers and seamen, an hospital for the decayed officers of the company's service, churches, the governor's palace, etc., etc. Here the util dulci has not been neglected, and those objects of national importance are placed in the proper point of view as the just pride and ornament of a great commercial people. Such is the effect of early prejudices that, under the muzzle of the sun, a Dutchman cannot exist without snuffing the putrid exhalations from stagnant water to which they have been accustomed from their infancy. They are intersecting it so fast with canals that in a year or two this beautiful town will be completely damned. In a few days we arrived in Batavia, the emporium of the Dutch in the east, and our first care was employed in sending to the hospital the sickly remains of our unfortunate crew. Some dead bodies floating down the canal struck our boat, which had a very disagreeable effect on the minds of our brave fellows, whose nerves were reduced to a very weak state from sickness. This was a coup de grace to a sick man on his premier entree into the painted sepulchre, the Golgotha of the Europe, which buries the whole settlement every five years. It is not the climate I am inveighing against. It is the Gothic, diabolical ideas of the people I indict. Were they only Dutchmen who supplied the ravenous maw of death, it would be impertinence in me to make any comment on it. 
but when the whole globe lends its aid to supply this destructive settlement and its baneful effects arising from the lech of a dutchman has for the stagnant mud than from the climate i hope the indulgent reader will pardon my spleen when i tell them professionally that all the mortality of that place originates from the marsh of fluvia arising from their stagnant canals and pleasure grounds the chinese here are the jews of the east and as soon as they make their fortune they go home let the amateurs of the republican system read and learn be not surprised when it observed it is observed that these little men those vile hawkers of spice and nutmegs exact a submission that the most absolute and tyrannical monarch who has ever swayed a sceptre would be ashamed of. The compass of my work will not allow me to be particular, but I must instance one among many others. When an idler, or one of the Supreme Council, meets a carriage, the gentleman who meets him must alight and make him a perfect bow in spirit not one of Bunbury's long barrows, but that bow which carries humility and submission in it, that sort of bow which every vertebrae in the English back is anachronized against. In our passage from this to the Cape, before we left Java, one of the convicts had jumped overboard in the night and swam to the Dutch arsenal at Hornroost. In passing Batan, we viewed the relics of Lord Cathcart. We met nothing particular in passing the island of Sumatra, but experienced great death and sickness in going through the Straits of Sunda, and after a tedious passage arrived at the Cape of Good Hope. Here we met with many civilities from Colonel Gordon, a gentleman no less eminent for his private virtues than his extraordinary military and literary accomplishments. From his labors, all the host of voyagers and historians of that part of the globe have been purloining, but it is to be hoped the world will at some future period be favored with his works unmutilated. The town is gay, and from length of habit the inhabitants partake much in the manners of Bath, and, for a short season, behave with the utmost attention and tenderness. Their dress and customs are more characteristic of the English than the Dutch. An uncommon rage for building has lately prevailed, and although they cannot boast that chastity of style in which Samarang is built, it is gaudy and calculated to please the generality of observers. Allow me to mention the singular manner in which the monkeys make their deprivations on the gardens here. They place a proper picket, or advanced guard, as sentinels, when a party is drawn up in a line, who hand the fruit from one to the other, and when the alarm is given by the picket guard, they all take flight, making sure by that time the booty is conveyed to a considerable distance. But should the picket be negligent in their duty, and suffer the main body to be surprised, the delinquents are severely punished. The same ill-fated rage for canaling murder prevails here. They have even contrived to carry canals to the top of a mountain. The boors, or country farmers, are a species of the human race so gigantic and superior to the rest of mankind in point of size and constitution that they may be called nondescripts. Their hospital, as to sight, surpasses any in the world. It may be observed, however, that the architect, by the smallness of the windows, which only serves to exclude light and air, seems to have studied with much ingenuity to render it a cadaverous, stinking prison. After being refreshed at the Cape, we passed St. Helena, the island of Ascension, and arrived at Holland, and had there the happiness through the interposition of divine providence to be again landed on our native shore. The end 
of A Voyage Round the World in His Majesty's Frigate Pandora by George Hamilton.